Welcome to the Comic Story and Channel, where we create complete stories and full stories. We take the lore to your favorite comic books and video games and movies, and we take that story and we present it to you in an audio narrative format, allowing you to enjoy it as a pseudo movie while going about your regular day. Well, at this channel, we've been around for quite some time, and because of that, we've got some older videos in playlists that people don't know exist. So we're going to take some of our really old videos and put together what we're calling the White Lantern Saga. Now, the story is going to begin with the Blackest Night, and at this time, we did very condensed storylines, so this is a very condensed version of the Blackest Night. And then the same thing with the Brightest Day. We then spread it out a little bit more as we tell you the story of Kyle Rayner and the New Guardians, and then what ends up happening to the White Lantern himself. So what you're going to get is old, old videos in a nice format to explain to you the full story of what actually happened to the White Lantern. Now keep in mind, we are going to be remaking the Blackest Night and Brightest Day storylines very soon, so you're going to get a much longer form version of those storylines. But for the sake of the White Lantern, this will give you the cliff notes that you need to understand what happened to Kyle Rayner, White Lantern. The Blackest Night happens after all of the Lantern types have been discovered, and there's a prophecy that the Blackest Night will be arriving soon. The Guardians have been doing what they can to prevent it, but after a few Green Lanterns get swallowed up by the Black Lantern battery as it calls out for flesh, it's too late. It's awake and it picks William Hand as its anchor to the mortal coil. This is also taking place during the period in which everyone thinks that Batman is dead, but he's actually traveling through time. So with that going on, things begin with Hal and Barry paying their respects to Batman, their friend who they think was recently killed by Darkseid. And they reflect on all of the friends that they have lost. Martian Manhunter, Aquaman, Firestorm, and countless other superheroes, and now Batman. They comment how they hope everyone finds a way back just like they did, and they head off from the graveyard. But somebody else was there. Black Hand steps out of the shadows and he takes Bruce Wayne's skull from his grave. Rise, Bruce Wayne, for the dead will rise. John Johns, Ronnie Raymond, Ryan Kendall, Roscoe Dillon, Lisa Snart, Digger Harkness, Arthur Curry, rise. Every dead superhero and villain suddenly receives a Black Lantern ring, and they rise from their graves. And John Johns, standing in front of Hal and Barry, would like to know, how are you guys alive right now? Things kick off right then with the dead walking amongst their former friends, and the first superheroes to fall are Hawkman and Hawkgirl to the Black Lantern Elongated Man and Sue Digby. And now that they're dead, Carter Hall, Kendra Saunders, rise! Over with Hal Jordan and Barry Allen, they look rather shocked to see John John standing in front of them. And Hal quickly uses his ring to figure out that John's isn't what he seems. And their fight begins. The Flash and Green Lantern quickly get away. But then our Black Lantern Martian Manhunter goes crazy on the city. Did everyone forget that he's as powerful as Superman? Flash and Green Lantern quickly go to work trying to stop him. But he quickly begins to mess with their minds. So that they think that they're fighting him when in actuality they're fighting each other. Meanwhile, back in space, the Black Lantern rings are moving over the entire universe, looking for any dead body that they can jump onto. And this is where things get really bad. Because Aquaman shows up and begins to attack Mara, Aquawoman, and Deadman begins to panic that his body is going to rise, but how can it rise when he's actually standing next to it as a spirit? More superheroes and villains keep reviving all over the place, and it even manages to take over Spectre, the spirit of vengeance. But things for the Green Lantern and Flash back over at the city get even worse with all of the local Black Lanterns showing up looking for them. Out in deep space, all of the dead members of the Green Lantern Corps begin to rise. Mogo included. And the other Corps, they're all dealing with their members reviving. Yellow, Sapphire, and Orange are all now facing enemies that cannot be defeated. Back on Earth again, the Green Lantern and Flash are trying their best to defeat their former friends. And they seem to be failing. That is until an Indigo Lantern arrives and shows that she can destroy the Black Lanterns by tapping into the emotional spectrum. She quickly grabs the Flash and Green Lantern and she teleports them to the Hall of Justice. Where standing there is Mera, Firestorm, and the Atom. They all ask her what is going on and does she know what these Black Lanterns and these zombie things are? And she explains that the darkness was here in the beginning and it was placed in check by all of the other emotions. Well, the darkness is now pushing against us again, and all of the Lantern Corps are going to need to come together to stop him. And by him, I mean Necron, the entity of the Black Lantern Corps. 
but before they can come up with a solid plan, the Black Lanterns find them and begin to assault this small batch of surviving superheroes. Caught off guard, the evil Black Lantern Firestorm quickly turns the current Firestorm's girlfriend into table salt, killing her and removing Firestorm from the equation. Every time the Black Lanterns kill somebody, the power levels on their ring continues to grow. And with the death of the other half of Firestorm, the Black Lanterns are at 56.56%. But killing the other half of Firestorm wasn't even their goal. You see, the Justice League keeps the bodies of their enemies in a crypt beneath the Hall of Justice. Which means that a whole bunch of former villains are now waking up as Black Lanterns. The Indigo tribe members see this as being a problem, and she quickly grabs Hal Jordan and warps him away to build a group of Lanterns to face against this coming threat. Flash, Mera, and the Atom all escape through a phone line using Atom's powers. Now across the galaxy, everyone is losing their fight against the undead. The Black Lantern Rings brought here by the Emotional Spectrum are being used to try and take over the entire universe, with Black Hand leading the charge as Necron's connection to the real world. The Lanterns need to come together, or this will end horribly. Knowing this, the Indigo Tribe goes out and grabs each one of the primary members of their respected core, and they assemble. Hal Jordan for green, Larfleeze for orange, Sinestro for yellow, Saint Walker for blue, Carol Ferris for sapphire, and Atrocitus for red. While they may not like each other, they all realize that they need to stop the Black Lanterns or everything will be lost. Back on Earth, Flash does what Flash does best. He warns everybody on the entire planet to hold off the Black Lanterns. They aren't your old friends. Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps are trying to stop the source of this right now. Just hold fast, my friends. We will win this day. But can they? Because just now, the power levels of the Black Lantern Rings are reaching 100%. And at 100%, Necron is brought to the Mortal Coil, and he revived all of Coast City as Black Lanterns. But don't worry because the Flash has friends, and the Teen Titans and the Justice League show up and they go to town destroying the Black Lanterns. I mean, come on guys, no one can stand up against the combined effort of all of our superheroes, right? And to add fire to that fight, the new combined lanterns show up and they begin to blast the Black Lantern battery core with all of their lantern beams. That's it guys, the superheroes win. Cue the happy music for winning. Wait, a black ring revives Batman. And then he spits out a crap ton of more rings. And Diana Price, Kal-El, Connor Kent, Bart Allen, Oliver Queen, die. You see, Necron explains that many of the superheroes have died, some of them repeatedly, but they didn't escape death. Necron let them go back to Earth, and he did it for this purpose, because they are all still connected to him. And now they are his Black Lanterns. But Barry Allen and Hal Jordan also recently revived, and the rings begin to chase them. Don't worry though, because Barry runs two seconds into the future, breaking the connection the rings had to them, making them temporarily immune to the chasing rings. To help even the odds once again, Ganthet of the Green Lantern Guardians causes a chain reaction in all of the rings, forcing them to duplicate and seek more members for their respected core. Welcome the newest member of the various Lantern Corps, Barry Allen for hope, the Atom for compassion, Scarecrow for fear, Lex Luthor for greed, Mara for rage, and Wonder Woman for love. They all go crazy on all of the Black Lanterns, melting them left and right. And through merging with Parallax once again, Hal Jordan is even able to take out the Black Lantern Spectre. But regardless of all the power they have, they still can't harm Necron. Eventually, after some infighting and a battle against Black Hand, Necron literally takes the heart out of one of the Guardians and slams it into the ground. And he's making contact. But with what? Behold the Entity, the beginning of life. And life in all of the universe began right here on Earth. And Necron aims to kill it because all living beings are connected to it. This is Necron's master plan. Kill everything by killing the Entity. But the Entity is just like any of the Entities for any of the cores. If he can be hosted by someone, they might have the power to stop Necron. And it's Sinestro who wants to prove his worth to everyone and save the universe as the first White Lantern. But it's still not enough. Necron just reaches inside of Sinestro and tries to rip the Entity right out of him. What can they possibly do to stop this? Hal Jordan gets all of the cores to blast Necron with the power of all of the rings. And he then says, Necron, you wanted to take credit for all of us coming back from the dead, but it wasn't you. We chose life, 
Everybody came back from the dead because we did it ourselves. We all chose life when given the option, and we are all connected to life. The entity sees this and gives everyone who came back from the dead a white ring. The White Lantern Corps is now born. The White Rings go even further and they revive William Hand back to humanity, which is Necron's connection to this world. And lastly, it revives everybody who rose first. Aquaman, Deadman, Hawkman, Hawkgirl, all of them are back. And with no connection to the mortal coil any longer, Necron is defeated by our superheroes choosing life. Things are a bit off in the aftermath. Heroes and villains have been revived from the dead, and for what reason, we don't know. Even the Anti-Monitor has been revived from the dead and is roaming free in the universe once again, and Black Hand has vanished with the Indigo Tribe. And Deadman is no longer dead for some reason. There also seems to be a single White Lantern crash-landed in the world right now. I need you to understand the Lantern Corps and their history. Everything for the Lanterns, it came to a head in the Blackest Night. I need you to understand that all the Corps had a prophecy, a purpose, and a goal. They all knew about the Blackest Night, and they all knew it was coming. But the Lantern story, it doesn't end there. The Corps didn't close their books and turn in their rings. One short individual, blue in nature, begins walking through this temple, talking to himself. He needs you to understand that the future is now unwritten. The universe has endured its horrible night and it entered a new day, the brightest day. My day. I wrote that in the oath so long ago for a reason. Before the Green Lantern Corps, before the Manhunters, I protected the universe under the watchful eyes of the Guardians and I will do it again. Not even Hal Jordan will stand in my way. As he enters a room with every core listed out, we see where Parallax went after he escaped in the Blackest Night. We see what happened to him. This person, this blue individual, has the entity that makes up the Fear Core, Parallax, held captive. Hal Jordan and Carol Ferris are celebrating the fact that they're alive and well. They have just stopped the end of the universe 24 hours ago, and they saved everyone. So what do two pilots do to celebrate? Well, they hit to the skies and they hit new limits. That is, until Sinestro destroys both jets as his way of saying hello. Hal and Carol whip out their rings to get ready for a fight, but Sinestro stops them. I'm not here to fight. I found the White Lantern and the Entity, and it's asking for you, Hal. But while Sinestro is explaining where the White Lantern is, we discover that oddly, Larflees is on Earth looking for the fictional Santa Claus. Saint Walker is helping bury the dead from the Blackest Night. And one of the Guardians along with Guy Gardner is explaining to Atrocitus that he's needed on Earth for his entity. So Hal, Sinestro, and Carol all head to New Mexico where the White Lantern is just sitting there all by itself. No one knows what it is or where it came from or even why it's here. So they each put a little effort into lifting it and discover that no one can, almost like it's the sword in the stone. But when they decide to lift it off the ground together, that's when something happens. That's when the White Lantern speaks. It cries out to the three lanterns standing in front of them, help me live. Around Hal, Sinestro, and Carol appears the constructs of everyone the White Lantern has revived, and it tells Hal Jordan to find them. He looks around confused and he says, who? And it states, find the Predator, Orphodyne, Adara, Proselyte, the Butcher, and Ion. And Sinesha realizes what this is. Hal, it wants us to find the entities, the entities for each core. The problem is, my listeners, Hal, Sinestro, and Carol are already behind the curve as our mysterious blue-skinned individual from the start is already at the location of Ion, the entity for the Green Lantern Corps and the entity for willpower. Ion is actually being kept by one of the noblest of the Green Lantern Corps members, and the power is being used to keep his son powered up. Our mystery person then takes Ion and he jails him up alongside Parallax. Well, while this was going on, Hal discovered that Atrocitus is on the planet Earth, and he heads over there to discover why. After a few blows are exchanged in what also involves a cameo by Lobo, Hal discovers that Atrocitus is here to get his entity, the Butcher. And he explains that he is here for the entity because someone is capturing them all. Someone is traveling the universe to trap each entity, and currently already has Parallax and Ion. Atrocitus then explains that the rest of the entities are all trapped on Earth right now, looking for new hosts. 
He then takes off. So Hal realizes that Carol, Sinestro, Atrocitus, Larfley, Saint Walker, and himself are all going to need to team up to capture these entities for their own protection. And while he and Carol are both worried about how deadly they can be, Carol says, maybe they're like the cores, and maybe they aren't all bad. During the discussions with Atrocitus though, our mysterious villain has arrived on Earth, and he's talking to an old Green Lantern villain. If you help me, I'll help you, Hector Hammond. So our journey to assemble the cores begins with Hal Jordan flying to Minnesota. You see, the local police have been reporting about a dog-looking monster going into people's houses and stealing things, and then he holds up in the local forest. So Hal takes a stroll through the forest until his ring warns him that the Light of Avarice is closing in around him. Hal looks around worried, and he realizes that the Light of Avarice is just Larfleeze's constructs putting up Christmas lights? He throws a few constructs at the Orange Lantern goons and they flee, leading him right to Larfleeze, whom he finds hunched over a desk writing a note. He asks Larfleeze what he's doing on Earth, and Larfleeze just says, I'm writing! What does it look like I'm doing? Now I'm very busy, Green Lantern! Go away! But Hal's not to be brushed off so easily. No, I mean, what are you doing on Earth? I live here now, Larfleeze says matter-of-factly. Well, Larfleeze explains that he wants to live on Earth because here everyone shares his greedy urges, and he wants to stay here until Christmas because that's when Santa Claus arrives. Side note, if you want to know what happens with Larfleeze and Hal for Christmas, now that he wants to meet Santa Claus, check out our Orange Lantern Christmas special because there is a story there. Anyway, Hal shrugs off this weird desire to be here and asks Larfleeze about his entity. Does Larfleeze know where Orphodine is? Larfleeze just holds up his lantern and says, I have him trapped in my lantern. Hal is a little surprised that that's exactly where the entity is, and he explains to Larfleeze that they're trying to save the other entities from something that's trying to kill them. But Larfleeze just looks in awe. What do these entities do? But Hal ignores him. Can you show me how you trapped Orphodine, he asks. And just then, the orange lantern is taken from Larfleeze and it floats over to Hector Hammond. Larfleeze freaks out, that's mine, and he begins to throw as many orange constructs as he can at Hammond to the point where he's actually getting in Hal's way. Meanwhile, while all of this is going on, Saint Walker is prepping a vessel for his entity to take over. Adara, the entity of hope, has arrived on Earth. Back with Larfleeze and Hammond, Hammond decides that he'll just use his giant head to swallow the entire lantern. And while Larfleeze can't believe that this guy actually ate what was his, a voice inside of the lantern says through Hammond, it's time for a makeover. Orphodyne then takes over Hammond's body, making him the host of the Entity of Avarice. A worried Larfleeze looks at Hal and he says, You know, it was a bit tricky to trap my Entity in my lantern. And Hal just nods, I figured. The oversized Orphodyne possessed Hammond reaches out and grabs Larfleeze with his tongues. You dare enslave me? But Hal steps in to prevent Larfleeze from being eaten. Are you eating aliens now, Hector? Isn't that a little over the top, even for you? And that's when the personality of Hammond takes back over, and he realizes that the one thing he's always wanted is now in his grasp. The one thing that will now become his. Carol Ferris. And he takes off at light speed. Hal and Larfleeze look at each other, and Larfleeze jumps on Hal. My lantern, I can't live without it! So Hal takes Larfleeze with him to Carol's last known location, in Las Vegas. Meanwhile, Carol is patrolling through Las Vegas looking for the Predator, the Entity of Love. When her ring picks up an extreme amount of lantern energy, assuming it's the Predator in action, she runs over to the location, only to find Larfleeze running around Las Vegas singing, VIVA LAS VEGAS! I'VE ARRIVED! The problem is that this isn't what Carol is sensing, as the Predator has taken over a host and a man who's been pining after a girl that he couldn't have. Seeing Carol, the Predator laughs at her and says, You are not the one I am here for tonight. And he blows her out the window, surely to plummet to her death. Except Hal catches her in a Green Lantern Lazy Boy Chair construct. I wonder if those come in various other brands. The host of the Predator keeps calling out for a woman named Lisa to love him, as Carol and Hal begin to battle with him. Larfleeze then jumps in since the Predator just ruined his buffet, but Larfleeze gets removed from the battle quickly as the Predator shows him the one thing that he loves and he wants his family, and that his family is actually still alive. Larfleeze is confused and he falls to his knees. The Predator then takes off with this Lisa girl, where he screams at her, I just want you to love me! But Carol explains, we all want that, and we all want to know what it feels like to be loved. This forces the Predator to stop in his tracks, and Carol reaches in stating that she wants the same thing. She then kisses the host of the Predator, which pushes the Predator entity out of the host, 
And then the Zamarians use this chance to teleport Hal, Carol, Larflees, and the Predator to their homeworld. You see, the Zamarians are the keepers of the Star Sapphire Rings. They are also known as the Guardians of Love, and they explain that they plan to trap the Predator. But Carol jumps in the way and tells them that they can't. The Predator didn't do anything wrong. Unlike the other entities, the Predator doesn't infect its host. It's infected by its host, and it took a host that just doesn't understand love. The Zamarians decide to restrain Carol as she's preventing them from trapping the entity, but the Queen steps up and says, no, she's right. Thus, with her last breath, she declares that Carol Ferris is her successor, and then she dies. Every Zamarian then turns to Carol and declares, All hail Carol Ferris, the new queen of the Star Sapphires. Boy, that escalated quickly. Meanwhile, Atrocitus and Sinestra are searching in Montana for the Entity of Rage and the Entity of Hope. Adara seeks out a young girl who's in a bad situation and joins with her. Back on the homeworld of the Star Sapphires, Larfleeze is going to town trying to kill the man who was hosting the Predator for stealing his privacy when Hal arrives and he tells him, Damn it, Larfleeze, when you work with me, you don't cross the line. Confused, Larfleeze yells at him, I didn't cross any line! Who's crossing what line? Is there a line at all? But before they can continue, Saint Walker calls to Hal, Come celebrate with us! Adara has chosen her host. Well, this can't be good. Hal and Larflees arrive just in time to see the young girl that Adara has possessed, and Hal begins trying to figure out what he needs to do to actually fix this. But Larflees? When Larflees arrived, he got struck with hope. Adara informs him that his family is in fact alive, and they do in fact know he's alive, and they miss him. Adara then reaches out to connect with Hal when the Flash runs through and wants to know. Alright, what's going on Hal? Explain this right now. Meanwhile, the Entity of Compassion has found its host in a dying EMT. Hal explains to Flash that he has the whole thing under control, it's fine! Flash can just go back to the Justice League and call it good. And that's when Adara states, all will be well. Hal just looks sheepishly at the Flash and says, I, um, I'm planning to fix that. The Flash goes on about Hal needs to have a reality check. He's teaming up with his enemies and he's ignoring the Justice League. He has other friends that can help, good guys that can help. And just then, the Indigo Tribe arrives with their vessel, declaring that they are here to team up against an unknown enemy. And they bring their entity with them. Hal and Flash realize right away that something is a bit odd because the Indigo Tribe has Black Hand with them. They question Indigo One, but she says that she gave Black Hand the ring and they gave him compassion. They then explain how Indigo Rings work to Hal, and he realizes that the Indigo Rings just brainwash their users. Side note, if you're curious a little bit more about the Indigo Rings and how they brainwash their users, check out the Indigo One Origins video. As Hal quickly gets his ring ready to attack Indigo One, now that he realizes that she's just brainwashed and stating that he doesn't know if he can even trust the Indigo Tribe anymore, our mystery villain finally arrives. But he isn't alone. He comes in riding Parallax the Entity of Fear, and he sends it into Flash to possess him. Parallax quickly uses the Flash's speed to begin wrecking Hal. Realizing that he won't be able to beat Flash's speed, Hal drags him off the ground and into the sky. But Parallax is too powerful, and he uses his powers to break free from the constructs and get back on the ground in a hurry, where Hal straight up challenges him. I know what you want, Parallax. You want me. What are you afraid, to try and take me over again? But our mystery villain stops them. You will not try, Parallax. You will not take over Hal Jordan again. With his previous experiences, he will likely resist you. And that's when we see who this mystery person is. Because Hal states that he looks like a guardian. But he has emotion. So at that moment, Saint Walker, Indigo One, Larflees, and Hal Jordan all turn on this villain. This evil guardian. And he just laughs. Thank you for bringing all of these entities into one location. And then he just absorbs them all. Hope, compassion, fear all join his collection as he removes his bandages and he reveals that he is Krona, the renegade guardian. You see, Krona was a guardian who wanted to explore the origins of the universe, and when he found it, he accidentally created the antimatter universe. Due to this, he was banished long ago by the other guardians. Meanwhile, Atrocitus and Sinestra are in an enormous fight with the Butcher and the Spectre, but it ends with Atrocitus getting the Butcher and placing him into a pocket dimension, you know, the same one where he keeps his lantern. Hal begins to unload everything into Krona, but then he discovers it was Krona who invented the lantern technology that enabled the trapping of the entities. And just as Hal figures this out and Krona is absorbing the energy of the ring, Hector Hammond finally returns with the Entity of Avarice. At the same time, Atrocitus and Sinestra arrive with the Butcher to join the fight. 
Hammond inspects Atrocitus, and he realizes that the Butcher is being kept in the pocket dimension, and Corona declares, I invented that also! And with that, he reaches into Atrocitus' pocket dimension, and he pulls the Butcher out. Corona then declares, I've done it. I have all of the entities, and now I can leave this wretched world and begin my conquest. He then hits every Lantern owner with a sheer blast of emotion. Hal wakes up in the Watchtower with Batman, Superman, and the Flash, and they ask him what the heck he was doing, working with villains, ignoring the Justice League, causing mass destruction with all of these other Lanterns. But Hal only wants to know one thing, what happened to Krona? And Batman tells him, you lost, Hal. Just then, the rest of the Lanterns teleport in with Indigo One's power, and they tell Hal to come with them now. They're gonna get their entities back, and they're going to fix this. Hal powers up his ring, and he apologizes to Batman, Superman, and the Flash, and then he vanishes. A much larger adventure awaits our Lanterns. Our story begins with a member of the Yellow Corps tormenting space pirates until his ring removes itself from his hand, and it takes off into space, claiming that he's been decommissioned. The space pirates that he was tormenting take this opportunity to attack and kill him. A member of the Red Corps saw burning murderers alive when he becomes decommissioned, and his ring leaves him, killing him as red rings act as the hearts to their wearers. A member of the Star Sapphire Corps loses her ring as she's trying to save a loving family from certain death, only to be rescued by fatality of the Star Sapphire Corps before she can perish. And Kyle Rayner, well, he's on Earth saving people as usual. And after a brief argument with a kid about his choice in costume, Kyle's day gets a lot more interesting, as a blue ring arrives declaring, Kyle Rayner of Earth, you have been chosen. Followed quickly by a yellow ring, a red ring, a sapphire ring, an orange ring, and an indigo ring. Kyle Rayner of Earth, you've been chosen. And Kyle simply declares, well this can't be good. If only Kyle knew how right he was as Arkillo of the Yellow Core jumps in to get his core's ring back, and then he gets sucker punched by an enraged Belize of the Red Core. Fatality of the Star Sapphires and Monk of the Indigo Core both teleport in, and they tell Kyle to give back what he's stolen. Each core begins their onslaught against Kyle as Belize spews napalm blood all over the bystanders, requiring Kyle to save them. And Arkillo throws Kyle through the ground and into the subway system. This entire time, the rings are circling around Kyle, and everyone is trying to grab their respected cores back. But once they do, they get hit with a charge, and the rings declare, Feedback Overload. So Kyle takes off of the skies, trying to get away from all of these other cores, only to become encased by a violet light crystal which imprisons him by fatality. But that won't stop Kyle, because his ring begins to declare its power levels are rising. 70%, 80%, 90%, 100%, 110%, 120%. Kyle breaks out of the crystal, and he realizes that this can only mean one thing. Saint Walker has arrived to aid his friend, and he lets Kyle know that he is here to see what's going on with the blue ring. But that doesn't matter, because all will be well. St. Walker overcharges Kyle's green ring, and the two of them blast off at light speed into space to escape the rest of these other cores. Kyle tells St. Walker that they're going to go ask Ganthet of the Guardians of the Universe what's going on, and the two of them travel through space. Now, while Kyle and St. Walker travel through space, I want to explain something. Ganthet is probably the only friendly Guardian as he understands what needs to happen, and he wants to see the universe be taken care of properly. While the rest of the Guardians just want straight order regardless of the cost, Ganthet is willing to embrace his emotions and allow them to help him in making the right decisions. He is the Guardian who handpicked Kyle, and he is the Guardian who started the Blue Lantern Corps of Hope with his fellow Guardian, Saeed. Both Kyle and Saint Walker view him as sort of a father figure. While the rest of the ring bearers decide that they're going to give chase to Kyle and get their rings back, just as Kyle and Saint Walker arrive on Oa. Kyle finds where Ganthet is located, and he heads to the main Guardian's chamber. A smile forms on Kyle's face as he sees Ganthet, and he heads over to see him and ask him what's going on, Ganthet. I haven't heard from you, and I was worried about you. But Ganthet replies, You should only worry about your sector, Lantern Kyle. Kyle looks puzzled. What's wrong with you, Ganthet? It's me, Kyle! And the other guardians reply with, There is nothing wrong with Brother Ganthet. His emotions were impeding his judgment, so we removed them for him. And Kyle snaps at them. You lobotomized him?! And the Guardians reply with, No, he is still fully capable. Now explain to us why these rings have sought you out. And Kyle just yells, I don't know! That's why I came to you, Ganthet! And just then, every ring slips onto Kyle's fingers. 
Kyle looks very worried, and he should because the next thing that happens is every ring welcomes Kyle to their core, and he wields every ring at the same time. A blast of energy shoots out of Kyle, knocking back all of the Guardians, and the Guardians stand there and state, This is impossible. No human can harness every emotion. Filled with rage, greed, willpower, hope, compassion, love, fear, Kyle overloads on all of it, and he loses control of every ring. They all shatter except for the orange ring, and he falls to the ground exhausted. Genthet comes over and declares, Krona tried the same thing, Kyle, and he was an immortal. You couldn't hope to control every ring. And just then, the orange ring reveals its true nature as Glomulus. It was never an orange ring. It was simply another member of the Orange Lantern Corps, which is just a construct of the Orange Lantern Corps. Kyle starts to wake up and he realizes what's going on and he simply says, This can't get any worse. And just then, every member of the other cores come barreling in. The Guardians of the Universe go to town, removing all of the threats that the ring bearers pose to them. Well, that is until Larflees himself comes through the ceiling, riding atop his personal guardian, Sade, declaring, You are all mine! Kyle asks Larflees if he plans to fight the Guardians alone, and Larflees replies with, Of course not! I expect my new Guardians to chip in! So the ring bearers all get up and they prepare to get involved in this battle with Larflees when Sade gets up and tells Kyle that if he wants to know why the rings were attracted to him, he needs to leave right this second. But Kyle refuses and he says, I can save Ganthet! And he jumps right back into the fight, telling Ganthet to let him help. But Ganthet tells Kyle, do not worry about me. You can't rely on the other cores for help. Stay here and let us guardians study you. Let us figure out why you're attracting the other rings. Trust me, one more time, Kyle, please. But Kyle sees that the Ganthet he knew is gone, and he blasts Ganthet with all the willpower he has, declaring, From now on, I forge my own future. He runs over to Monk and he tells him to teleport all of these new Guardians out of here. They need to go. And boom. Just like that, they all end up on Okara, the homeworld of the Orange Lanterns and of Larflees. Bleez immediately takes on for the Red Lantern homeworld in a hurry, and Arkillo is furious at Monk for forcing him to retreat. But after Saint Walker calms down Arkillo, they have a chat about what's going on. Sade and Larflees explain why his ring wasn't a ring, and why the rings went to Kyle. You see, Larflees and Sade felt something pulling at the rings, trying to get the power out of the rings. Larflees felt that this was happening because he always holds on to his lantern. So he sent Glomulus out to pretend to be a ring to see where the others were going. He then sent Sade to the location that they were being pulled from. And what Sade found was an entire solar system sized ship that looked like a solar system coming through a white dwarf star. So Arkillo, Fatality, Saint Walker, Kyle, Monk, and Glomulus all head to the solar system sized spaceship to investigate. What they discover is that each of these planet-sized ships is actually a planet on the inside. They've got a remade Tamaria, they've got a remade Okara, as well as other well-known planets in the Vega system, all recreated right down to the inhabitants. They discover that this collection of worlds is a remake of existing worlds in the Vega system in its entirety, which is the solar system that Larflees resides in, and this ship is calling itself the Orrery. This entire ship and this entire remade solar system is presided by one man, the Archangel Invictus. He steps out and he witnesses that he's being invaded by other ring bearers. And just like the orange light wielding scum, he begins to utterly wreck the entire group. His power is insane and one by one, he breaks down the ones who he says wield the darkness. They don't even stand a chance against him. Until he reaches Saint Walker. St. Walker uses his power to see into Invictus' mind to bring him hope and try to fix his attitude. But the blue light of hope brings forth nothing, because as Invictus says, he is the hero of this tale, and he is the hero here to rescue a solar system. He sees that St. Walker obviously fights for what's right, but he seems to be confused. So he explains what his purpose is. You see, the Archangel Invictus and his people, the Archangels, used to watch over the Vega system. They were trying their best to cultivate this into a powerhouse of a solar system with super intelligent and passive races. Everything was going as planned until one day, Larflees came out of nowhere and began trapping the residents of the planets in his orange ring, turning them into his orange lantern constructs. The Archangels of course fought back, but they kept losing to Larflees, and their race doesn't die like normal. Once an Archangel dies, his power goes back into a pool in which all of the Archangels share from. So every time Larflees killed an Archangel to add to his collection, they would slip out of his grasp until Vindictus was the last remaining Archangel in this universe. 
Eventually, this led Invictus into a direct fight with Larflees, and the two of them fought. But due to the fact that Invictus had all the power of all of the Archangels at his disposal now, he was actually able to begin defeating Larflees, and he opened up a white dwarf star so that he could banish the evil ring wielder. But Larflees had his own plans, and he used his constructs to throw Invictus into the portal instead. So St. Walker looks at Invictus confused. Then your purpose can't be one of vengeance, he states. And Invictus replies, no. I rebuilt the entire solar system so that I could replace the tainted one that Larflees has created. Well, since Invictus has been taking so long explaining his evil plot, Kyle was able to recover and he asks, if you were able to remove our rings, why didn't you while we were down? And Invictus replies with, if I could remove your rings, I would have defeated the orange beast eons ago. So Kyle puzzlingly looks at Invictus and says, so you didn't remove a bunch of ring wielders rings and send them to me? And Invictus says, what nonsense, who told you I could do that? So they begin to try and talk it out to solve the issue, but just as they appear to be getting somewhere, Belige returns and she begins to spray napalm blood all over the place, screaming, you dare take a red ring? Of course, this makes Invictus mad as he thinks that their plan was to distract him. The fighting begins again, but it doesn't get much further as Invictus is still all powerful and still able to remove the threat of the ring bearers without a problem. After a little bit more fighting and a little bit more of talking, Kyle finally talks down Invictus again, and Invictus agrees to stop on one condition. Kyle and these new guardians, they'll kill Larflees for him. Well, the new guardians leave the orrery and they try to decide what they're gonna do now, but first, they need to go charge their rings. A few things happen during this period, such as Arkillo learning that he is one of the last Yellow Lanterns and getting the Weaponer of Quark to work with him because Sinestro has gone through and destroyed the Yellow Power Battery and he disbanded the core as a Green Lantern. St. Walker returned to his homeworld to discover that it was being assaulted by the Reach, which is the homeworld of the Blue Beetle armor. The Blue Lanterns lost their battle that day, and the Blue Lantern power battery was destroyed as they tried to get it off of their planet. But since the Blue Lantern world was hidden from all, St. Walker assumes that it was Larflees who gave out this location. So he decides it's time for Larflees to answer for all of his crimes. The group comes back together eventually, and they decide that they are going to go get rid of Larflees. It's time for him to answer for everything he's done. I mean, he's an evil guy, he's killed billions, and now a whole solar system is about to die because of his actions. While they may not kill him, it's time for them to remove this problem from the Green Lantern lore for good. So they come up with a masterful plan in which they'll sneak in and attack Larflees. But honestly, none of it works, because Glomulus is one of Larflees' constructs. So anything that Glomulus knows, Larflees knows. Kyle looks hurt, and he looks at Glommy, and he says, I thought you were one of us. I thought we were friends, Glommy. And Glommy just looks sad, but he feels he betrayed Kyle. But Larflees replies with, I have friends too, and you'll be joining them today. And he begins his attack on the new guardians. Meanwhile, at the edge of the Vega system, Invictus arrives, and he announces that he's here to get rid of the entire solar system for its crimes and its debauchery. He will abide this no longer, and with that, he destroys an entire planet and replaces it with his own. Back with Larflees and the New Guardians, the attacks continue with Larflees just laughing as his toys it beat on these New Guardians. And while this is all going on, St. Walker demands to know why Larflees sent the Reach to destroy his homeworld. But Larflees just laughs. I didn't send anyone after you, Blue Lantern. If I wanted to destroy you, I wouldn't have shared that pleasure with anyone. But Kaio realizes Larflees' is one weakness, so he tells Monk to channel the energy of Avarice back on Larflees, burn him with his own greed. Furious, Larflees smacks Kyle over the head with his orange power battery, and he tells Kyle to prepare to join his collection. But just then, Glomulus jumps in and screams, Master, no! Larflees just bombards Glomulus with his power, and he swallows him back up into the ring, and he tells him, You stay dead this time. Furious that one of their own has gone down, the Guardians rally together and they attack Larflees once and for all. They're doing this for Glomulus. They're doing it as a team, as the new Guardians. And Larflees calls out, My pet Guardian! Save me! Save me, pet Guardian! But Sayid has had enough, and she joins in declaring that she was never Larflees' pet, and he will stop hurting them after all she did to bring these new Guardians together. And then Kyle realizes, Sade is the ring thief. Sade started this whole thing, and he simply stops and asks, Why? And she replies, You of all people should know why I did this, Kyle. But the rest of the new guardians also stand firm, and they ask, I think we'd all like that answer, Sade. But just then, Invictus's floating planet ship looms overhead, and the group decides that they might want to finish this first. 
Since their fight with Larflees is obviously over, Kyle asks Larflees to join them in this fight. They're gonna need the power of Avarice to join them since Glomulus is no longer with them. It's going to take all of the colors of the spectrum to stop Invictus. They all hurry to the latest planet that he's planning to attack, and Invictus himself begins the battle with them by jumping down from his ship and attacking Larflees straight away. One billion years I have waited for my revenge. And the rest of the new guardians? They stand there and they watch. They all agree that Larflees deserves just a little bit of a beating. And eventually, they jump in to save him. They use all of their powers combined for an epic battle against Invictus, and while they are battling against him, they have the Weaponer of Quard move the Orrery away from Invictus, traveling farther and farther away. And everyone realizes that Invictus's power is coming from his solar system sized ship. With it leaving, he has no powers anymore. And he realizes this too, but he realizes it a little too late, as they continue to move it away, and he begins to fade into nothing paid out of existence, and he finally perishes. Larflees grabs Invictus and says, I finally got an angel! And he takes off for Okara again. But the rest of the lanterns stop right there and they look at Sade and they demand to know what's going on. Sade explains that when Ganthet's emotions were taken from him, his mind cried out across the galaxy and Sade felt the most intense and overwhelming thing ever. She felt them extinguishing his soul. She was the only one who knew what happened to her beloved, so she made a desperate plea and she took the rings from the weakest members of each core and she sent them to the one person who loved Ganthet as much as she did. She sent each ring to Kyle because Ganthet chose Kyle originally because of his potential to command every shade of the emotional spectrum, something the Guardians couldn't even do. She was hoping that Kyle would learn to control every emotion and tap into ultimate power and save Ganthet. But the rest of the cores don't like what they're hearing and they decide that this group was poisoned from the start by Sade. So they all leave. Have you ever wondered where this all began? Where did the Guardians discover this power? Who was the first to harness the emotional spectrum? Who is the first Lantern? The Guardians were well-intentioned. They always had the betterment of the universe in mind. But somewhere along the lines, they slipped. Something went wrong. They discovered a man one man who had somehow tapped into the power known as the Emotional Spectrum, and one man who led Krona down his dark path. This man became the First Lantern. This man became the prisoner of the Guardians as he was deemed too dangerous to just let roam the galaxy. The Guardians went on to use his power to start their Green Lantern Corps, and now they've decided to tap into his power one more time, this time to create their third army. You see, the Green Lanterns have been deemed a liability. They're just too impulsive. They make their own decisions and they don't listen to the Guardians. They're driven by heart. After many mishaps in the eyes of the Guardians, they've decided to remove the Green Lantern Corps and replace it with this army, the Third Army. Quickly, we see the usefulness of this army as they create the first soldier. He jumps onto a nearby man and he absorbs him. He changes him into one of its own kind. It takes over his mind, it takes over his flesh, and it ejects the weakness of the Green Lantern Corps, the heart. It erases any form of individual thought, and the only thing that remains is the eyes of the original owner, forever locked in a state of fear. So where are Hal Jordan and Sinestro after our last adventure? So Nestor discovered the Book of Black, and he took it back to what he calls his Batcave. He then went ahead and gave Hal Jordan a charge in the Green Lantern ring that he gave him last story arc, and he brought him to the book, which they opened, revealing to them the entire Green Lantern history, and sucking them up inside. But he didn't trap them inside like it's done before. It spit them out right in front of Black Hand, while he was enjoying Chinese food with his family. They have an epic battle which ended in Hal and Sinestro using all of their power to defeat countless Black Lantern puppets. With Hal Jordan weakened and defeated, Black Ant had an opportunity to kill him, but he held off as the Book of Black told him, Hal Jordan will become the greatest of the Black Lanterns. So Black Hand let them get up, and their fight continued while he demanded to know why it said that. How can Hal Jordan be a Black Lantern? But Hal Jordan didn't know, so their fight continued until a force spoke through everyone's rings, every emotional spectrum ring, all of the colors all at once. Let me out! Something cried out through all of the rings, and it was the first lantern being awoken to be used as the Guardian's power source. Sinestro and Hal didn't know what that was, and they had bigger problems on their hands with Black Hand. But just as the Guardians were moving to their position to use the power of the first lantern, they saw through the rings what Hal was doing. 
They saw that Sinestro gave Hal a ring and they were working together to defeat Black Hand and they decided that this could become a potential problem. They thought they removed the problem known as Hal Jordan. So they instantly teleported there and protected Black Hand. And then they declare, Black Hand, you will be our new lantern. And they overcharge him to max power. He turns his full power against Hal and Sinestro. And then Black Hand begins to suck them up into the land of the dead. The land of the Black Lanterns. The land that is in his ring. As they're getting sucked up, their rings both decide that they are dying. And they begin to try to pull away from Hal and Sinestro. But in an explosion of willpower and death, Hal and Sinestro vanish. And their rings take off for the heavens to find a new Green Lantern. The Guardians then teleport Black Hand into the Chamber of Shadows, where they were keeping the First Lantern, and they declare that he is now their power source. But the ring that was on Hal and Sinestro's finger, it remerges back into one and takes off at light speed to find a new Green Lantern. One without the intentions of the Guardians, one with the intentions of both Hal Jordan and Sinestro. It lands on a man named Simon Baz, and then a mixed message begins to play, which basically tells him, STOP THE GUARDIANS! But before he can do anything, the Justice League would like to know what he's doing with the Green Lantern ring. And as much as I would love to tell you this story, this is a tale for another day because it's Simon's origin story. So let's go across the galaxy. Now you see, Hal and Sinestro are luckily not dead. But they aren't in our universe anymore. They're inside the realm of the Black Lanterns. And without them, there's no one to warn the rest of the Green Lanterns. There's no warning as to what's coming. And because of this, the Guardians have begun assimilating the entire galaxy. With them reaching far and wide, they end up intercepting Guy Gardner and his Green Lantern Honor Guard. And as much as Guy Gardner tries to fight against them, he loses every single one of the Honor Guard. Due to this, Guy Gardner and the Honor Guard failed the mission that they were on, and when Guy went back to Oa to try and explain what happened, that these weird monsters arrived and took everyone, he was forced to resign his ring by the Guardians. All a part of their plan to ruin the Corps, and its strongest members. But Salak and Kilowog have been secretly watching this whole thing unfold, and they're trying to figure out how they can stop the Guardians, how they can prevent this from happening any further. But before Salak can even do anything, the Guardians see him. And they come down hard, locking him up and removing any potential problem that he may possess. He yells out that you're giving up on life! And as they lock him away, they tell him, no, Salak, we're saving it. Things can't get much worse. Hal and Sinestro are believed to be dead. Guy Gardner's been kicked out of the court. Jon Stewart has been sent on an endless mission to try and re-piece Mogo together. And Kyle? Well, Kyle is out in space trying to master each of the rings. He's trying to learn every emotion to become a White Lantern, the ultimate power of the Lantern mythos. Now, he's aware that Hal Jordan has gone missing, and he knows that Ganthet is in trouble. And if you're curious as to how he knows all of this, check out our Green Lantern New Guardians video. But if only he knew how bad everything was, maybe he'd be trying to stop it right now. Because right this second, he's actually studying under Atrocitus. And while it takes some convincing, he masters the rage of the Red Core. But while he's struggling to contain these emotions, he realizes that this journey isn't complete as he takes off to find Arkillo, and he learns how to control fear. And while this is going on, the Guardians travel to the homeworld of the Star Sapphires. You see, they know the danger that Kyle Rayner possesses to them, and they know that Carol Ferris is currently training him to take on all of the emotions of the Spectrum. So while they can't track Kyle anymore because his ring is contaminated, they can find Carol and find Kyle that way. Kyle continues his journey by learning compassion, and then eventually, he has to go get greed from Larflees. And after Carol promises to use her abilities to locate the one thing that Larflees wants, his family, he agrees to teach Kyle how to be greedy. But before they can make any real headway, the Guardians send in the Third Army because they tracked Carol to the location of Larflees. And as Larflees say to Carol and Arkillo fight the Third Army back, Kyle grabs the Orange Lantern to charge off of it. He must learn to control this emotion. And now he just wants it! He wants it! He wants it more than anything! But now is not really the time to begin losing yourself into the emotion. And Carol realizes how much of a problem this is, as Kyle's losing himself to the greed emotion. And Arkillo, Carol, and Larflees all rush to Kyle to help him get out of there. And Sade yells out, Tell Ganth that I loved him, Kyle! Do not let him die a soulless monster! And Sade stays behind to battle the Third Army alone, dying in the process so that everyone can get Kyle out of there. To find out what happened with Sade and Gantha to get to this point, you're gonna need to watch the previous two Green Lantern videos. I'm really sorry, but we can only put so much into this video. 
Meanwhile, Ganthet looks on as Sade dies before his eyes by looking through the eyes of the Third Army, and he's not even disturbed. He has decided that it's time to end the potential problem of Kyle, and he will do it himself. So he goes to their last location, the homeworld of the Star Sapphires, to end Kyle himself. You see, Kyle's actually managed to master every single one of the emotions, except for love. He lost one of his greatest loves in his life, and he still hasn't gotten over that, so he can't conquer love yet. But he does fly to their homeworld to try and master this power. It's the only thing standing between him and the power of the White Lantern. And when he gets there, he sees Ganthet, and he knows what's coming. And Ganthet opens up with a blast of his power. He hits Kyle and he tells him that he was a mistake, that he should never have given him the ring. And Kyle whips out the power of fear yelling, I am not a mistake! And then he channels compassion and he teleports next to Ganthet, only to eat a blast of the guardian power to the face once again, which enrages him. So he channels rage, but Ganthet just grabs him and he wraps him up in the guardian's power. You see, I know that you've mastered avarice and hope, but six emotions will not be enough to defeat me. You are going to need love, and without love, you cannot win. And it would appear that the Zamarians agree with Ganthet because they blast him with the power of love. And just as everyone is beginning to win, the third army descends on Zamarian, ready to absorb everyone there into their army. When suddenly Kyle's friends, the new guardians, Carol, Saint Walker, Arkillo, all arrive to put an end to this. And everyone declares, ignore the monsters, focus on their master. And they use everything on Ganthet, declaring that Ganthet must die only to have Kyle leap in the way and yell out, NO! If you believe in love, then you need to believe that I can get through to him. And Ganthet looks on in disbelief. Kyle stopped everything to save him. So he stabs Kyle in the back, literally. Kyle falls to the ground and the blood begins to pool around him. All hope is lost. The one lantern who could have possibly gained the power to stop the Guardians has been defeated. And as he dies, he looks to Ganthet and he says, I forgive you, old man. And get that turns. Love is forgiveness? What imperial nonsense. But Kyle believes it. And he taps into the final emotion. The emotion of love. And upon mastering the final emotion, Kyle becomes the first and the only White Lantern of the White Lantern Corps. Instantly, he understands all, and he understands why the Guardians feared him becoming the White Lantern, as he uses the power of life on the Third Army, instantly killing them. Ganthet sees that he has failed to stop Kyle's transformation, and he rockets off back to Oa to tell the other Guardians. And back on Oa, the Guardians begin to realize that they are spreading their army far, far too thin. And with the White Lantern awakened, they're going to need to tap further into the First Lantern. They will get the power that they need. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Simon is still learning how his ring works and learning what the Third Army is. But now Badge has arrived and is showing him how to charge his ring so that he can learn the message that Sinestro and Hal have left behind. Immediately, both messages begin to play again, but Badge tells Simon to just untangle the messages. And that's how they understand what happened. How Sinestro split his ring and gave one to Hal because the Guardians kicked Hal out of the core. How they battled against the Black Hand. How the Guardians showed up and powered up Black Hand and possibly killed them. While this is going on, Badge finds the Book of Black and he tells Simon that they're going to use the Book of Black to find Hal Jordan and bring him back. So pack your things because we're going to go looking for the greatest Green Lantern ever. But before they can leave, they have to pick up civilian Guy Gardner and bring him with them after they fight off some more of the Third Army. But Hal Jordan and Sinestro are somewhere else right now, somewhere in the land of the dead. Tomar Ray explains that they're here in the land of the dead for a reason. Because they need to stop the First Lantern. The Guardians are not the problem. The First Lantern will change Lantern history as everyone knows it. And the dead demand that they help. And just as you think that this couldn't get any worse, the Guardians put out a fake distress call to get all of the remaining Green Lanterns who haven't figured out their evil plan yet to come back to Oa. They recall all of the Green Lanterns for an inoculation against the supposedly unknown threat that is taking over the Green Lanterns. But Guy, Badge, and Simon know that this is a lie. Kyle Rayner knows that this is a lie. And Kilowog knows that this is a lie. So Guy tells Badge and Simon to figure out where Hal and Sinestra are, and he asks Badge to give him a power suit so that he can go straight to Oa and get his ring back. This is oddly not the most suicidal thing that he's ever done. So Simon and Badge open the book, 
and they find themselves sucked into the chamber where Black Hand is being kept. And while I would love to continue this story, we will come back to that very soon. Once Guy gets to the Ring Foundry, he quickly finds that Kilowog has been hiding there, and he asks for a sit rep. What's going on? So Kilowog explains that the Guardians have an energy field going, and the moment a lantern lands, he is locked into the energy field and unable to move. Any lantern flying in sees Green Lantern standing there at attention, so they're all falling for it, thinking that this is normal. So, realizing that he's gonna need to try something drastic to get the Guardians off of the mainframe and allow Kilowog to warn every incoming lantern, Guy remembers one toy from an earlier adventure that's still lying around, and he attacks the Guardians head-on using Corona's power gauntlet. While he puts up a good fight, the Guardians overwhelm him rather quickly. So they ask him, why would he come at them alone? And he smirks, I was the diversion. It's called self-sacrifice, you ancient blue bastards. Kilowog uses this moment to finally tap into the central power battery and alert everyone. The Guardians are in control of the Third Army, and they're trying to eliminate the Green Lanterns. I don't know why, but we need to stop them. But if that wasn't enough, Kyle Rayner shows up as the White Lantern along with the rest of the new Guardians. Kyle cracks the Ring Foundry, allowing Guy Gardner's ring to go free, and Guy Gardner is back in the Green Lantern Corps. So the entire Green Lantern squad, the entire New Guardians team, even the Manhunters that Atrocitus is controlling, all battle against the Guardians and the Third Army. And seeing that they're officially going to lose this, the Guardians decide to draw on as much power as they can from the First Lantern to turn the tides in their favor. But at that exact moment, Kyle hits them with everything he has, everything that he can muster with the power of every emotion, causing the Cell, holding the First Lantern to break and the universe stops. It's time to meet Voltham. It's time for everything as you know it to end. When everything left off, reality ended. Everything ended. The Guardians leashed their power from a being known as the First Lantern, known as Voltham. They created a third army of creatures to remove the Green Lanterns as the Green Lanterns had become a liability in their eyes. Just as the fight was about to be resolved, they tried to draw too much power from the First Lantern, and they broke his cell. He is now free, and he's not happy with the Guardians. They messed up the universe. The Guardians took his gift for granted. He arrived from another universe, and he showed them the true power of the emotional spectrum. They were afraid of it. And then, they were afraid of the First Lantern. So he takes Ganthet and he simply says, Let's see if we can fix this. And he pulls Ganthet apart like a deck of playing cards. Every moment of his entire life laid out before the First Lantern. He sees the moment that they met. He sees the moment that they forged the rings. He sees the moment that Ganthet met Hal Jordan. The moment that the Red Lanterns were discovered. He sees everything, and he finds the moment that he's looking for. The moment that the Guardians decided to discard their emotions. He goes to that moment in Ganthet's history. And he has Ganthet convince the rest of the Guardians not to dispose of their emotions. What would happen if he did that? Reality itself would begin to shift, and the timeline would become altered, and a new future would be told. Back in the Chamber of Shadows, Black Hand and Simon Baz are talking about what they should do. That Simon Baz is looking for Hal Jordan, when suddenly, the history of the Green Lanterns instantly shifts. Black Hand is no longer Black Hand, and the ring that Simon Baz holds returns to the original owner, whom didn't die in this timeline, Amin Sur. That's right, that simple change in the history of the Green Lanterns, the Guardians keeping their emotions, changes everything, and the First Lantern has the power to make this happen. But things instantly snap back to normal with Black Hand and Simon Baz in the Chamber of Shadows. The First Lantern hits the ground and he realizes that he's been imprisoned far too long. He's going to need to recharge if he's going to permanently alter the history of the Guardians and the Green Lanterns. So he looks further into Ganthet, and he sees Hal Jordan, Kyle Rayner, Guy Gardner, Jon Stewart, Carol Ferris, Saint Walker, and all of the other ring bearers. It's a good thing that Ganthet knows some individuals so full of emotional power that the First Lantern won't have any issue free charging his power. Meanwhile, back with Black Hand and Simon Baz, Black Hand looks at Simon. What did you do to me? Are you trying to trick me? 
If you want to find Hal Jordan so bad, why don't you join him? And he sucks Simon up into his ring. And as Simon hits the ground in the land of the Black Lanterns, Sinestro looks at him and he says, Please don't tell me you're the human who's supposed to rescue us. The First Lantern goes to town quickly by grabbing Guy Gardner, who is at the site where he broke free, and he pulls Guy Gardner's life apart. He tries to alter his history, to change it so that he lost his brother and sister. He alters it over and over. Worlds where Guy kills everyone as a Red Lantern. Worlds where he is pure rage. The First Lantern tortures Guy with all the possibilities that could have happened, and they all drive Guy's emotions to their peak, and he feeds off of it. He does it so much that Guy begins to beg for it to end. And then he moves on to Kyle, and he pulls Kyle apart, just as he did with Ganthet and Guy Gardner. But Kyle's a little easier. He sees when Kyle lost his girlfriend to Alex, and he teases Kyle with the world where Alex lived, to the point where Kyle begs to have that life. And then he rips it away. It's the misery that he wants, so much emotional power. The First Lantern continues his onslaught on each of the members of the Corps, tearing them apart over and over. And deep down inside of Black Hand's ring, Sinestro, Hal Jordan, and Simon Baz are trying to figure out what happened. But Hal and Sinestro have differing ideas of how they can get out of the world of Black. Sinestro wants to take the ring off of Simon Baz's finger and just leave Hal and Simon there. But Hal insists that they need to work together to stop the Guardians. And that's when Tomar Ray explains, none of this matters. The biggest threat isn't the Guardians anymore, it's the First Lantern. Voltham came from an unknown time in an unknown place, and he arrived just as Corona was discovering the light of creation and the Guardians discovered the emotional spectrum. The Guardians were terrified of the power that the light of creation was teeming with. So Voltham took it all into himself and he became the First Lantern. But he refused to share the power of creation with them, so they ended up initially building the Manhunters just so they can stop him. But they discovered that he had become creation itself, and if they defeated him, they would destroy the universe. So they locked him away so they can feed off of the emotional spectrum that was trapped within him. Now that he's free, he's feeding off of the pain of your friends, and he's charging himself until eventually, his fake worlds and his fake constructs will become reality. And he becomes the very light of creation once again. But just as Tomar finishes explaining, Badge pulls Simon out of the world of Black. You see, Badge has been battling Black Hand this whole time in the Chamber of Shadows, trying to get Simon out of it. And Simon reaches out for Hal Jordan and says, I'm not leaving you! The universe needs the greatest Green Lantern ever. Through sheer will, the ring duplicates itself once again, and it begins to go to Hal Jordan. But Sinestro jumps in the way yelling that Korrigar needs him. When suddenly, in a sheer explosion of will, Sinestro uses a moment of weakness in Hal to take the ring and get out of the world of Black and back to the real world, where Badge, Simon, and the real New Guardians are standing there. These are the New Guardians who never removed their emotions, and they've been hiding in the Chamber of Shadows this whole time, trying to contain the First Lantern. Sinestro grabs Simon and he holds him in a chokehold and he simply says, Now where is this First Lantern? Back in the world of Black, though, Hal realizes that he can't wait for someone to save him again. He needs to get out of here, and there's only one ring in the world of Black. The Black Ring of Death. But he can't use it if he's still alive. So what if he wasn't alive any longer? During all of this, the First Lantern continues his onslaught by tearing apart Jon Stewart's life, by tearing apart Fatality's life. He tears Carol out of reality, forcing her to fight for her love over and over again, and he shows Atrocitus what could have been. And it's Atrocitus's rage that finally feeds him enough emotion that he can finally alter reality. He's finally on the cusp of having sheer power of creation at his fingertips. But he isn't done powering up. He needs more power. He wants to alter everything. So he warps in to find one person who keeps popping in and out of everyone's memories, Sinestro, and he finds him in the Chamber of Shadows. So he pops in there, takes him, and he warps away. He takes him to Korrigar so that Sinestro can defend it one last time. And defend it he does by actually hurting and damaging the First Lantern. No being can contain Sinestro. He will defend Korrigar. But the First Lantern laughs. I can't believe you hurt me, but it doesn't matter. I needed you here to witness this, Sinestro. You see, over the years you've created so much emotion in this planet. What happens if I take it away from you? What if you fail in your job to protect it? And with a single thought, the First Lantern destroys Korrigar and all of its inhabitants except for Sinestro. He then leaves.
It's what he needed. But Sinestra was hiding something in the center of that planet. A yellow power battery that is now free and floating in space. Meanwhile, while the First Lantern was busy dealing with Sinestra and Korrigar, Mogo the Living Planet took this chance to encase everyone in pieces of his planet so that he can sever their connection to Voltham. Mogo begins to pull them all to his surface to keep them safe, but Voltham immediately knows something is wrong and he instantly warps back, shouting, Who dares? He takes off for the service of Mogo and says, I'm far from done. There's just so much more for us to experience together. Now let's see if a planet can scream. He then rips out other versions of everyone, their versions that are red lanterns, the versions that are yellow lanterns, and he makes them real as constructs, and he sends them in to replace the real versions. Everyone goes to town trying to defeat themselves. This is the Green Lantern Corps, though, and they push through. They use their will to show the First Lantern who's boss. They control their destinies, not Voltham. And the constructs stop. They all vanish. And Mogo yells out, It wasn't Voltham. It was me. Voltham is still dealing with Korrigar. I gave you, the Green Lantern Corps, the things to fight, the things that you needed to take your frustrations out on. You all needed to realize that you control your own destinies, not the First Lantern. As you are the last line of defense against Voltham. And Guy just yells back, You have a funny way of getting us back in fighting shape, Mogo. But it worked. And the entire Corps prepares for the final battle. In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape our sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware our power. Green Lantern's light! Meanwhile, Carol Ferris has slipped out of the First Lantern's grasp and she got away and she rocketed to Kyle as quickly as she could and she found him on the floor of his apartment. Kyle comes to his senses and he begins to ask the White Ring where everyone's location is, but the White Ring can't find anyone. So he asks it, Hal Jordan or Sinestro? And it says, Sinestro found. So Carol and Kyle take off at light speed to his location, only to discover Korgar has been destroyed. And with so much death, it throws Kyle off. But before he can get his footing back, Sinestro comes barreling in furious over all of this. He demands to know how Kyle has a white ring, and he wants him to fix this, raise his planet. But Carol fights back, demanding to know where Hal Jordan is, only to be batted aside by Sinestro telling her, he's dead, now revive my planet. But before he can do any more harm to Kyle, he's quickly wrapped up by Badge and Simon standing there. And Badge tells him, calm down, have respect for the dead. Kyle looks to Sinestro and he tells him, I'll try, but not for you, Sinestro, for all of the lives that were snuffed out here. And so he pushes his power to the limits. He tries his hardest to create life, to revive the dead. He is able to open the door to the lands beyond life. But the people of Korrigar need to walk through it. They need to help him. And they don't. So his revival fails. So Sinestro realizes that there's only one route left to him. And he grabs his yellow lantern and he takes off for the first lantern to get his revenge. The first lantern during all of this was busy giving a speech to the Guardians. He's reminding them of how this all started. How they tapped into the emotional spectrum, creating the first ring. How he reached into the spark of creation itself and it forever altered him. He was infused with all of the emotions, and he created the Great Heart and the First Lantern. He then reached into Ganthet's mouth. I need this back now, the tool that you used to keep your emotion all of these years. How you differed from the other Guardians. And he pulls out the First Ring. Ganthet has had the First Ring this entire time. And then the First Lantern reaches out, prepared to alter all of reality to fit his whims. When Green Lantern cuffs appear out of nowhere and they land on his hands. But the First Lantern just laughs. You all don't know yet. I'm back in tip top shape. Anything that I imagine is real. And the final battle begins between the Green Lantern Corps and the First Lantern. But just then, the Red Lanterns also arrive. And the fight continues. But the First Lantern just bats everyone off of him. It's not enough. They can't win. When suddenly, Kyle shows up with the entire Blue Lantern Corps and the Star Sapphire Corps. And Guy Gardner calls everyone up. Everyone converge on me. I have an idea. And he has every ring bearer fire their energy into Mogo, who then focuses it all into one beam and fires it all at the First Lantern. And for the first time, he's weakened. But it's not enough. You only delay the inevitable. I have seen my destiny, he tells them as he gets back on his feet. Until Sinestro arrives and he begins to beat on the First Lantern with the power of fear. 
You only delay your own death, he declares. But it's still not enough, as the first lantern just grabs Sinestro. I am not ashamed to admit that I know fear, Sinestro. And suddenly, out of nowhere, the Indigo Tribe teleports all around them and channels death, opening a gateway to the land of the dead. Carol looks on horrified as Hal Jordan comes through the portal as a black lantern, leading every soul that the first lantern ever killed into battle. Take him, Black Lanterns! He is yours to get your revenge, Hal cries out. But the first lantern kills every Black Lantern in one move, and he grabs Hal Jordan by the throat, and he traps him into a bubble. You, you are the one who has touched every side of the emotional spectrum, from death to life. Yet, at your core, you were never altered. You are more powerful than even the power batteries themselves. If I can find one moment in your life, I can get the last bit of power I need. I can get the spark of creation back. What is the one moment that you were most fearful in your entire life? And he pulls out the moment that Hal lost his father. The last moment that he was truly afraid. The first lantern kneels down in front of young Hal Jordan. And he says, what is your wish? With tears in his eyes, young Hal Jordan looks up and he says, my dad, I want my dad back. An adult Hal Jordan just begins to tear up. That's it. That is what the first lantern needed. And he reaches into Hal Jordan, pulling out the spark of creation. Sinestro realizes that even with the combined power of everyone, they can't stop the first lantern. It's all failed. So he has one last idea, and he takes off for the green power battery, where he pulls out Parallax, the entity of the Fear Core. Take me, creature. I will be your host. And with the power of an entire core, Sinestro takes off right to the first lantern, and he tears his heart out of his body. The Guardians all look on fearful, terrified of the power that Sinestro now possesses. And the first lantern just looks at him. You think of me as a petty lantern? I am a god! And seeing that Sinestro was going to need a little help, Hal Jordan decides that he'll bring the entity of his new core to the fight. And he raises Necron, the entity of death! Necron begins the battle with the first lantern, and using this opportunity, Hal Jordan bombards the emotional spectrum that is inside of the first lantern, not the first lantern himself. And with the power that he throws at him, he removes the emotional spectrum from the First Lantern. Otherwise, the First Lantern's death would destroy the entire universe. Hal Jordan continues to lay on him until the First Lantern becomes human again and Necron kills him. Hal Jordan lands in front of his younger self and he tells him, Don't be afraid. Everything is going to be okay. I've saved the day. And he absorbs his younger self back into himself, and a green ring senses it. Hal Jordan of Earth, you have the ability to overcome great fear. Welcome to the Green Lantern Corps. Without a person to host his entity any longer, Necron fades back to the land of the dead. But we're not done yet. Sinestro takes off to kill the Guardians, and Hal Jordan chases after him. The two titans of the Green Lantern mythos begin their final bout. And Hal Jordan tells him, I'm not going to kill you. You can still come back from this. I've seen what kind of Green Lantern you can be. And Sinestro tells him, the Guardians have to die. Everything is their fault. The Manhunters, the Third Army, even the whole First Lantern disaster. They destroyed Korgar with their poor decisions. They deserved to die for what they did. And Hal Jordan stops. Deserved? You see... Atrocitus has already killed the Guardians. Their first creation, the Manhunters, destroyed his entire sector, and it's left him this rage-filled monster since we met him. All he's wanted is to get his revenge, and he got it. But he did leave one Guardian for Sinestro, Ganthet. And as Sinestro went to kill Ganthet, he asked him, Won't you fight me? Hal looks at Sinestro, and Sinestro looks at him. I'm leaving, Hal. All of this is done. You'll never see me again. And Hal stops. I want to ask you one thing. Were we ever truly friends? Sinestra stops cold to that question. That's the tragedy of all of this, Jordan. We will always be friends. 
And that is it. The other Guardians, the one with emotions who have been trapped up with the First Lantern this whole time, they've decided to take over the Green Lantern Corps by learning from the greatest Green Lantern's example, Hal Jordan. And combined with the power of the Star Sapphires and the Blue Lanterns, everyone begins to rebuild Oa. The emotional spectrum itself has been spread out into the universe so that the cores can use it. There is no First Lantern. There is no one person containing everything. And there is no all-powerful being any longer. This is the end of our tale, my friends. But before we close this chapter in our stories, as massive as it is, there's one last thing. A secret only you, me, and four other people in the galaxy will ever know. You see, when Sinestro left, he went to one place where no one would ever find him. He didn't kill Ganthet. He brought Ganthet here with him. And he asked Larfalis to bring Sade. Ganthet and Sade to look at each other, overjoyed that they both survived. They don't need to know how they survived, how Sade survived the Third Army, or that Sinestro didn't actually kill Ganthet. With tears in their eyes, they embrace finally getting to be together. And Larfalis looks at Sinestro and he asks him, what do I get for this? Sinestro tells him, You get the greatest secret in the entire galaxy, Larflees. Knowledge that Ganthet and Sade survived and are together. Larflees looks a little puzzled, and he says, Well, that doesn't taste so good after rat wheel cheese. But Sinestro just leaves them all there to be together forever in secret. Things have been calm since our last adventure with the Lanterns. Nothing to fear, no universe-ending disasters. Kyle Rayner is still the White Lantern, and he's still able to communicate with all of the emotions within the spectrum. Out of all of those emotions that he can channel, though, he feels that hope is one of the strongest, because even when their homeworld was taken from them, they did not lose their hope. They found a new homeworld, and they set up a new power battery there. They never stopped believing that all will be well. So it doesn't surprise Kyle that Relic came here first. Kyle arrives in the homeworld of the Blue Lanterns just after Relic, bringing the new Guardians and Carol Ferris of the Star Sapphires with him. What fortuitous timing, Kyle! St. Walker exclaims. I tried to warn you through the rings, but he's blocking us somehow. Relic has arrived on this planet to suck the power battery dry of all of its hope, and Kyle flies straight up to his face to talk to a mano y mano. Stop, Relic. They haven't hurt you. They haven't hurt anyone. I wish that were true. And with that, he continues to suck the power battery dry of its hope. You don't really think that you can harm me with your rings, Lightsmiths, do you? Us? No. And then he motions for the Guardians to bombard Relic with the source of all willpower. Them? Probably. But just as they're starting to make headway, the Guardians all enter a mental landscape with Relic, by themselves, with no help from anyone. I need each of you to see, feel, understand. And Relic shows them the truth about what he is doing. The truth about the emotional spectrum! This truth cripples each guardian, and they all fall to the ground, allowing Relic to continue draining the blue light of hope. Carol decides that it's her turn, so she bombards Relic with love, but it doesn't affect him, because as she says, he's already filled with love for everything. Kyle decides to tap into the yellow light of fear and blast Relic with fear, but he slaps it away, claiming that he's already seen the worst fears that the universe has to offer. If only you knew what a waste this was, what a precious resource that you squander, Relic says as he continues to suck the energy from the Blue Lantern. And then he redirects all of the Lantern's energies back at them. Kyle dodges his, Carol maneuvers around hers, but Saint Walker takes a full blast to the chest and he falls out of the sky. As he falls to the ground, Relic completes his absorption of the Blue Light. Brody looks on in horror. Brothers, the battery is empty. Our rings are all that we have left. And you will lose even that. I cannot allow another universe to end because of your arrogance. And Relic burns the ground, bombarding all of the ring wielders with everything that he has. Brody throws up a blue shield using the little energy that his ring still holds, while Kyle runs to St. Walker's side. But the Guardians run over. Lantern Rainer, this is a fight we cannot win. You need to understand. And they reach up and they pass the memories that Relic shared with them. Kyle finally sees what the Guardians saw. He understands what Relic is doing, and he understands what the point of all of this is, and he realizes that there is, in fact, no hope. Kyle, we need to leave. Teleport us out of here with your indigo lantern powers. 
Carol calls to him, but Kyle can't teleport everyone. There's just too many for his ring. So Brody turns to him. Keep hope alive, Kyle Rayner. There are secrets that even the White Lantern does not know. And he overcharges Kyle's Indigo Lantern ring, allowing him to teleport the Guardians, Carol, and Saint Walker away. The rest of the Blue Lanterns sit there, and with no blue light left, Brody looks up at Relic. All oh, will be well. And Relic turns them to bones and dust. So who is Relic? He is from another universe where the ring wielders were actually called lightsmiths. And he discovered something terrible. The lightsmiths were actually using a resource known as the emotional spectrum for the betterment of their races. And they ran out. He learned it early on that the emotional spectrum was limited in its energies. And by wielding those powers, the lightsmiths were draining the universe. They failed to listen to him and the universe died. Their source wall crumbled and all life was propelled into the void of nothingness. He was pulled in himself, but the void made him anew with the new universe, a surviving relic from a version of creation that would never be known again. Billions of years passed until eventually he was awoken again by the presence of Kyle Rayner and these new guardians. He cannot allow the universe to implode again. He will stop these ring wielders and he will prevent the emotional spectrum from running on empty. Meanwhile, over at Oa, the Lanterns are wondering what's going on with their power battery because as they're all reporting into Hal Jordan, it recently spit out a rather ill looking Ion, their entity, and then Ion flew off into the sky. The power battery then temporarily shut down all rings, almost killing a lot of Lanterns. But before they can get any real information on the situation, Kyle warps in on the scene with Carol, St. Walker, and the Guardians. Kyle explains the situation to Hal, that the Lanterns have all been destroying the universe, and that there is one individual coming now named Relic that defeated all of them and intends to absorb all of the light. Hal looks at Kyle oddly. One old geezer beat all of you? In our defense, he is large. Greetings, green lightsmiths of this universe. I have come to collect your light. Surrender now, and I will allow you all to leave this planet unharmed. We're lanterns, Gulliver. Green lanterns. And surrender isn't in our dictionary, Hal tells him. Then you leave me no other choice but to teach you. Spectrum collection has begun. All of the green lanterns begin to feel their energy being absorbed by the small robots that Relic is sending out. So Hal throws his green light at Relic. You want light? We'll give you light. But Relic just looks annoyed as he redirects the energy back at Hal Jordan. Well, I seem to pack a punch. Everyone, let's do this, Hal shouts as he gives everyone orders. Kyle and Carol need to swat away the robots while John and Salak go off to protect the Lantern Reserves, and Kilowog will round up all of the new recruits. Hal himself will begin the battle against Relic, but Relic throws his attacks aside and he redirects the energies. Everyone is quickly overwhelmed, and no matter what they do, they can't stop him before he drains the entire green power battery. Hal and the rest of the Corps look on in horror as the central power battery explodes and Oa begins to tremble. Saddened, Salak says Oa is about to die. Relic turns to Hal and John as they come barreling in ready to fight. Still refuse to lay down your rings? Green Lanterns have one thing that can never be stopped, willpower and they continue their battle against the giant known as Relic, but he just tosses them aside again. So John looks at Hal. We need to retreat. Our rings are losing power. And if we stay, we'll lose most of the core, if not all of it. Take everyone and get off the planet, Hal. I'll distract him. I'll make the final stand. John, you can't be serious, Hal says. But he knows that there is no other option. The whole planet begins to shake and quiver without the central power battery to keep it afloat. And Hal calls to arms all of the core. Be ready for John's signal to leave. We're going to escape. So John takes the best soldiers that he can muster, and the recruits who are ready to lay down their lives, and he gets everyone ready for the ultimate showdown with Relic. They use as much power as they can to make a construct-based army, and they begin the battle against Relic and his collectors. As John stands valiantly against Relic and his collectors, all opposition from Hal, Kyle, and everyone else leaves, leaving them the opportunity that they need to leave the planet finally. Once everyone is safe and Oa is on the brink of exploding, John takes his men and they leave the planet as one of his trusted friends sacrifices himself so that everyone else can leave. After saluting his fallen comrades, John heads to the planet of the Indigo Lanterns to get their help. Relic moves on to the next phase of his plans because he has enough energy to do what he must. And out in space staring at what was once Oa, Hal is at a loss as to what he should do next. But everyone agrees that they should go to Yasmult and talk to Guy Gardner. 
because he's currently the leader of the Red Lanterns, and the Red Lanterns are a mix of emotional spectrum and blood magic. Maybe they have an idea on how they can stop Relic. When out of the blue, all of the entities arrive in front of them, all of the true source of the emotional spectrum just show up. They all enter Kyle Rayner's body, transforming him into the ultimate entity host. Without a word, Kyle begins to take off in a different direction, and Hal orders for the core to stop him in his tracks. If all of the entities are in Kyle, they can use this, but Kyle waves off all of the Green Lanterns, and Hal yells stop, and the entities listen. We can all hear you. We all know the struggle that you are dealing with, but it is not Relic that made us weak. This is bigger than you, Lantern, and if you wish to go to Yasmult, then go! And with a wave of their hand, Hal and the core all vanish, and Kyle is left alone to struggle with the voices of every entity in his head. It's too much and he can't resist them as they begin to search for the Butcher, one of the missing entities. Luckily, the Guardians were not thrown to Yasmult, and they're here to save Kyle and help him gain control once again. The entities are inside me still, but I have control, Kyle tells them as it begins to calm down, and he does gain control. The Guardians look to Kyle and they tell him that maybe they should all convene with Hal and the others at Yal's vault then. They'll be a little behind, but they can get there. But Kyle stops them. No, I know what the entities know. And we can't stop Relic. We need to help him. Back with Hal on the core, they arrive on Yal's vault to get the help from his undercover agent, Guy Gardner, the current leader of the Reds. But Guy isn't too happy with Hal, and he feels that he's been deserted among the Reds. After a fist fight and an argument, Guy Gardner agrees to aid them, but on one condition. The Red Lanterns will get Earth's sector to patrol after this is over. Back in space, Kyle Rayner takes off to get the Butcher, the entity of rage that is currently being contained in Atrocitus's body after he was kicked out of leading the Reds by Guy Gardner. Kyle takes the Butcher into himself, and he leaves Atrocitus afloat in space with Dexstar here to help him. Once all of the groups are assembled, they all head to Relic's position to find an end to this. Relic is currently at the source wall, the edge of the universe, and he's trying to find a way through the wall to existence itself. Kyle is the first one to arrive and he looks at Relic. I have all of the entities, and with their power, there isn't much that I can't do. That may be true, but I will not surrender my cause to a mere threat. You don't understand, Relic. I want to help you. The source wall must fall. Back with Hal, Guy, and Carol, they decide to get moving. And since Carol is a star sapphire, she can warp to the one that she loves, which is now Kyle Rayner, much to Hal's dismay. So she starts the teleportation process to get everyone to Kyle at the source wall. But before they get there, Relic and Kyle are running out of options to open the source wall. Relic doesn't have enough power to get through. So he grabs Kyle. I accept your offer to help. And he begins to drain the light of the White Lantern and the entities themselves. Just then, Carol, Hal, Guy, and the rest of the cores arrive, and they begin to open fire on Relic and his collectors, and they quickly break Kyle free, and right at that moment, John teleports in with the help of the entire Indigo tribe. He tackles Guy, saving him from a blast, and calling his new outfit the outfit of a deranged Santa Lantern. And with the aid of the green, red, and indigo cores, they all open fire on Relic's ship, causing it to explode from the inside, and then crash into the source wall, forcing it to become one with the source wall. Hal watches it become part of the wall and remembers. Anything that the wall touches, it absorbs. He finally has an idea. Ring, check everyone's charges and keep us updated. John Stewart at 5%, Guy Gardner at 12%, Hal Jordan at 6%, and Kyle Rayner at 28%. Hey Kyle, get in the fight, why don't you? Guy says to him sarcastically. We've got enough power for one more run, so don't waste your energy on blasts or constructs. Indigo One, teleport us between Relic and his reflectors. So that's exactly what she does, and they all literally jump onto Relic's head, and they all begin to push him backwards towards the wall as he struggles to fight back. But once they gain momentum, Hal, John, and Guy all back off like planned. But Kyle, he uses the last of his juice to continue pulling Relic towards the wall. Kyle's ring overcharges as he pulls Relic into the source wall. Relic finally sees the source behind the source wall as he attempts to pull himself out. Then Relic becomes one with the source wall. Everyone stares in horror as they realize that Kyle just gave his life to replenish the emotional spectrum. By going through the wall with all of the entities, the emotional spectrum is officially refilled. Kyle's gone, Hal says. He went down on the line of duty, and we'll honor him for that. But now, we need to get everyone home, Hal. So the Indigo tribe surrounds all of the Green Lanterns, and they begin a massive teleportation, warping everyone to Mogo, the giant planet-sized Green Lantern, and their new home. 
The Indigo Tribe was even nice enough to use their ancient arts and restore the green power battery. So Hal raises his recharged ring into the sky. And the brightest day and the blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware our power, Green Lantern's light. And then he realizes that no one is reciting it with him. One of the Green Lanterns stepped forward. Don't you see, Hal? Relic was right. While Kyle's sacrifice did replenish the emotional spectrum, the clock is already ticking down to when the universe will end again. And who's to say that there will ever be a White Lantern again to replenish it? Meanwhile, across the galaxy at the Source Wall, the Guardians stand at the absorbed Relic and they comment on how losing Kyle Rayner was a great loss for them. Only to see a rainbow shoot out of the wall and outsteps Kyle. Tell us, Kyle, what happened over there? The entities, they sacrificed themselves. They're dead. What else do you remember? You must have experienced so much. I don't remember. But then one of the other guardians speaks up. Kyle Rayner's revival must be kept secret, brother. For it is time for his true journey to begin. We now go to Carol Ferris on the homeworld of the Star Sapphires, trying to explain what happened to the Star Sapphire Council. She is sad because she started to develop feelings for Kyle. But at that moment, she gets an odd message from the new Guardians, and she leaves at top speed. You jerk, she screams at Kyle as he stands in front of her smiling. You let all of us think that you were dead? Kyle, why didn't you tell me that you were alive? I did tell you that I was alive. That's why you're here, he retorts. No, the Guardians asked me to come here, and I'm quoting here, to address a matter of concern regarding Lantern Rainer. Uh, sorry? She then jumps into his arms, just happy that he's alive and here. And she asks why he isn't telling anyone else. And he explains, Satan Walker is in a coma. Guy is a Red Lantern now, and John would just tell Hal, and he isn't ready for Hal to find out. At that moment, one of the Guardians brings over a native to the planet that they are on, and he holds his hand out. I am nice Denth Rodden, and I am happy to be making new friends. So Kyle holds out his hand. I am Kyle Rayner of the White, friend of angry women. Carol isn't exactly happy with that remark, and Nias walks them through the planet, introducing them to a utopian paradise. His people, the Exurias, have accomplished something that no one else has managed to pull off. Perfection. He then jumps off the tower backwards, forcing Kyle and Carol to jump after what they are assuming is a suicidal alien. But the planet actually catches him and floats him to the bottom. Nias explains that the planet provides. No one on this planet has a need or a want. Everything is perfect and provided for them. And once Kyle and Carol are alone again, Zala, one of the Guardians, approaches them to explain why they're here. Their predecessors, the original Guardians, tried for centuries to create a utopia, and they failed horribly. While this planet that was once on the same path as Earth has managed to do it by themselves. She wants Kyle to explore this planet until he finds a place that he isn't allowed to go. Because once he finds that, he'll find out how they did this. Because paradise doesn't come without a cost. Something must have been done to these people. So as the Guardians distract Nias, Kyle uses his ring to sense all of the emotions in the spectrum. And he can of course detect love, will, hope, and compassion. But it's the feelings of anger and fear that make him curious. Because it's coming from all of the teenagers heading to a single large building. As Kyle says, if you're looking for fear and anger, teenagers are the way to go. Kyle and Carol head to that spot, where oddly, they are welcomed to actually enter the structure. They do not hide anything here. As a matter of fact, they want everyone to see this. That is what these young ones are doing. They are coming to see the truth. Carol looks at Kyle. This has re-education written all over it. But Kyle does as the Guardians have asked him, and he walks in alone to a room filled with people. How anticlimactic, Kyle says to himself. He demands that the one on the ramp stop what he is doing. None of this feels right, and if he's hurting these kids, I am, the man says. And this causes Kyle to pause. Not the answer that you were expecting, friend? Well, most villains don't come out and say it. I am to be the villain in this then, huh, friend? So he invites Kyle to look at the broken mirror thingy so that he can explain. This planet is able to look into other timelines, timelines where small and large changes have happened. And then they go there and they take the change. They take the miracle from another timeline. He then takes Kyle and he walks through the mirror, showing a world engulfed in flames and destroyed. They take the best timelines and they leave the subpar timelines with the other worlds. Sometimes they take small changes, but sometimes they take big changes. Kyle is in shock. You're stealing futures to create a world where everything has gone right? Yes, 
and all of our people must accept it. Some do, and they come back knowing what is sacrificed for them, while some can't deal with what they've done and choose to stay in those worlds to try and help those people. And you think that this makes it okay? Kyle demands to know. I do. If we left those moments in place, many timelines would be okay, but only by small amounts. Instead, we can make one perfect place. And that's when a spear comes out of nowhere and hits the old man. Kyle takes him back through the portal, but then behind him he sees who threw it as the residents of the destroyed timeline are here to get their future back. Kyle immediately begins to throw around his constructs, but for some reason he can't hit the invader, and that's when the guardians tell him. It's a living structure. It won't allow violence. If Kyle keeps using his ring, the structure will keep pushing back and it will prevent him until he destroys the planet. So he makes a willpower based bubble around the invaders. He then uses the power of hope to heal the old man. The invaders break free from the bubble and they begin with their plan to kill everyone on this planet. Then the alternate old man comes through the gate to reconfigure the structure and turn it into a mass portal allowing all of the other timelines to cross if they want to. Carol looks up at all of the other destroyed timelines. Oh, this is not good. Kyle then begins smashing the mirrors trying to prevent the portals, and with the change in the structure, the protection systems are down, allowing Kyle to properly use his ring. An all-out war begins on the planet with the invaders attacking everyone, and Kyle and Carol try to hold them back, but with them keeping the invaders busy, the Guardians have an idea, and they begin heading off in a different direction. Kyle then begins battling against the other world's champion, an alternate Nias, and he's trying his best to win this fight and save the planet. While all of this is happening, the old man that controlled the portal and the one from the alternate universe realize they are actually one and the same. As much as they tried to picture each other as monsters, they are just different versions of the same person. During this talk, Kyle is hitting the alternate Nias with everything he has until he finally gets a free shot at the device on the alternate Nias' arm, the device that can reconfigure the structure. He then smacks him down, winning their fight. The structures begin repairing themselves, and Kyle holds the biggest culprits to the invasion, while Carol, as she puts it, pushed the alternate versions back through the holes. She really doesn't have a vocabulary for this. Kyle then gives them an ultimatum. Shut these portals down and make it right, or he will. And with that, he takes off into space until Carol catches up and asks, Are you okay? Because giving an ultimatum like that doesn't feel like you. Kyle explains that he has all of this power, but sometimes, even the best solution is the worst one. And he can't let them keep stealing futures, so if he has to be the one to lay down the law, so be it. He then takes off into space to think. But the new Guardians have their own conversation. Did we learn all we wish to learn from this? No. Lantern Kyle does not understand what he saw beyond the source wall. But they are still coming, and he is not ready to face them. We'll have to keep testing him. There is something coming. Something incredible and something ferocious. Kyle needs to get ready for his role as the White Lantern, but some wonder if he can even do it. It's time for his next trial. Our story begins without him, though. In Space Sector 0619, an alien race is telling a father that he has to pick one of his children. He then escorts his child to an altar-looking location, and he tells him this is a great thing. In the center of the structure, a holy being sits, ready to accept his offering. He then reaches down, and he places his hand on another child's head and with holy fire he burns him alive. So the child that was walked up here then begins to cry. He doesn't want this. He doesn't want to be an offering. He doesn't care if the sun rises tomorrow. And that's when a being in armor jumps in killing the god. He tears off the god's head and he declares, I bring you freedom. As the sun begins to rise behind him, the people realize that this was a false god. Meanwhile, in Sector 0001, not far from the Source Wall, Kyle Rayner, the White Lantern, Carol Ferris, a Star Sapphire, and the New Guardians are on a journey of discovery to learn about the White Lantern and its powers. It contains the powers of all of the Lantern Rings and of life itself. Someone say that it turns its wielder into a god, but is that true? As they're flying to their next location, Kyle is explaining that there are currently six Guardians with them, but there was a seventh. After they were confronted by Relic, he left the group to seek his own answers and discover the universe on his own. Kyle had a bet on how long the new Guardians would last in this journey, and he's currently winning because one of them has now left their company. But that's okay. Zala, one of the Guardians, also had placed a bet as to how long it would take Kyle to notice that one of the Guardians had left, and she won that bet. With that, they arrive at the planet Kalosa, their next location. Carol asks what they're looking at, and Kyle tells her, a planet. 
But Palco explains the planet to them before she can jam her ring up Kyle's... Well, you get the idea. This planet is not particularly remarkable, but recently a new religious sect has popped up and they are spreading their word as the light in the fire. They are a peaceful empire with a peaceful religion that has been going from planet to planet spreading their word and bringing each world into their religion. The interesting thing that has drawn the attention of the new guardians is that each world that this religion touches gets better and it grows. That's when Kyle sees the cost of this peace. They appear and find an army of murder caterpillars, as Kyle puts it, bombing the poor farmers in the area. So Kyle and Carol get to work saving the day with their rings, except that they're told to stop. Everyone stop! Kyle looks down to see a tamarind woman standing there in a robe. Bloodshed is not the way. It is not what she would want. It is not what we want. She explains that the army has been dispatched to round up the religious sex members because their beliefs of equality and liberty make them an inconvenient target for the elite. Kyle asks why they don't fight back as she tells them, It is not our way. It would only incite more conflict. Every time you push back, they shriek harder. And then she points down at the army that Kyle was just fighting. Looking down, Kyle sees that there are more weapons coming in. He face palms. Carol, you take the murder caterpillars on the right end. How many cannonballs do you think you can stop with your ring? Not enough. So one of the new guardians flies in. I think this will take a different approach. And he tries to reason with them. But they fire their cannonballs, and Carol and Kyle have to try and stop as many as they can. But then he realizes, this isn't going to work. They can't stop them all before the people die. So he tries something new, and he spreads compassion over the entire planet. And everyone stops. They feel everyone else's pain, fear, anger, hope, will. Both sides have shared their feelings with each other, and neither can bring themselves to fight any longer. Carol looks at the ending conflict. Well, that worked. Not really. I can't spread it very far, just what happened in this spot. And when it wears off, they're going to fight again. He then stands up and sees the burning city in front of him. I wish I could have stopped this. And then, the incredible happens. The light in the fire comes to the planet, restoring everything. A being of pure light and fire has appeared. The goddess that they worship, Zal. But elsewhere, in Space Sector 0170, the God Killers have picked up on her arrival and they realize the object of their obsession has returned to the world and it's time to kill it. The Goddess appears to Kyle and everyone. Would you not kneel? Sorry, no, I'm not really inclined to bend the knee for a light show. I've seen gods before, might have been one. You won't kneel? Zal shouts, spreading her fire all around. Good, you're right to be skeptical. And frankly, I've had quite enough of the kneeling. Carol asks, so not a god then? But Zal stops that train of thought. I am a god but not one that requires or enjoys worship, and not one who enjoys false modesty enough to deny what is obviously true, she says looking at the new guardians. You know us? Zala asks. What sort of god would I be if I did not recognize fellow gods? I am Zala, and we are not gods. Is that so? Your kind reshapes the world to fit your ideals, and you prefer to call yourself guardians, but I see it differently. Kyle interrupts them. So are you a god in presence alone, or are you here to help? It is my power that will help, Zal announces, and her structure begins to melt, and it begins to reshape the world around Kyle. I'm gonna need to know a little bit more about you before I let you do this, Zal. There's that arrogance again. Do you think you can stop me? But a few moments later, a streak of blue races through the sky, and it lands in front of Zal. The God Killer then stands up. I have found you, Destroyer. Confused, Zal tells him, I have not hidden. Why have you come here? You don't remember us? You do not remember the tale of your creation? The Makers arrived at your god's homeworld and they kidnapped her. They then experimented on her until they granted her this power. And in her wrath, she destroyed the planet that the Makers were on at the time. My homeworld. You came to our world and we saw hope. But you only brought destruction with your rage. He then commands the rest of the god killers to land. And they all spear Zal with their weapons over and over killing her. I can't die. And then she explodes in light and fire. Her disciple hits the ground, screaming, No! And Kyle floats over to them. Kyle is damn right, no. The lead god killer turns to Kyle. We will do our duty as god killers, and I suspect you, White Lantern, will do what you believe to be yours. So be it. Kill them! The god killers jump in, battling against Kyle, Carol, and the new guardians. And they try their best to keep the god killers focused on them, and not the city. But that's when the guardians notice. Whatever weapons they're using are far stronger than they ever should be. If this fight continues to escalate, it will endanger the entire planet. But that's the least of their worries. Azal is not dead, and she is very pissed. As Kyle's getting beat down with those weird weapons, Zal begins to burn with the power of a god. The equivalent of small nuclear blasts start going off and scorching the planet. 
She then begins creating fire tornadoes, wrapping everyone up in them. The Guardians don't even have the power to stop her, and they do their best to contain her fury and rage. But while she's exploding in power, the God Killers kill her disciple Kala. With so much rage spilling over this planet, and Kala dying, Kyle absorbs all of their hatred, and he allows the red power of rage to flow through him. He begins blasting the lead God Killer and forms a construct power suit around him to beat the man down. He then begins to lose control and he almost hurts Carol, but he stops and he realizes that he's absorbed too much hatred. Kyle realizes that this is a losing battle and if this continues to escalate, they will lose the whole planet. So he takes Carol's hand and he tries something that he's never done before. He uses the full power of love and compassion and he pumps it through his every fiber in his being. All of the God Killers are teleported away and Kyle hits the ground with his assets leaking out of his own body. The Guardians fly over in a hurry with Carol begging for them to help him, and they stabilize his form, barely. Zal screams at them, You will tell me where you sent them! This cannot be allowed to continue! And Zala tells her, You know we will not tell you, and if you try to force us, this planet will suffer. You can be more than this. You can help these people. You can be what Kala believed you to be. We will not force you, but we will ask. Be what your children need, Zal. Zal turns away from the Guardians to Kala, her fallen disciple. I'm sorry, Kala, but this can't happen again. And she vanishes. Over with Kyle, Carol is holding his head in her lap. Did we win? Because if we lost, this is the worst afterlife ever. The God Killers are gone, Zal is gone, and your brains are in your head. That's when The Guardians float over and they ask Kyle how he's doing, and they tell him that he did the impossible. He teleported all of the God Killers out of their weapons and armor, and away. While he may not want to accept that he is a god, even the Guardians don't know the full range of his power. Perhaps, he may want to admit what he's becoming. Meanwhile, on the old homeworld of the Blue Lanterns, the God Killers are preparing to survive and find a way to get their revenge. After everything has happened, Kyle is sitting at his desk in his apartment trying to draw. It's all wrong. Something is broken about it. He holds his hands to his head and he tells himself, I can see it in my head. I just can't get it right. The messed up, broken looking girl next to him apologizes for looking the way that she does and he tells her, it's not your fault, I'll get it right. He begins to erase the drawing and the girl next to him begins to vanish from existence while a black and purple energy flows around him oddly. Meanwhile, Carol has finally returned home from her journeys with Kyle in space and after being berated by her board of directors, she decides she needs a break. So she flies to New York to have a little stay in Kyle's apartment while he's off world. But after he opens the door, she asks him, what are you doing here? I live here? No, I mean on Earth, Kyle. You told me you were gonna stay with the Guardians while I went back home. Kyle looks confused. I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I just needed to be here. I needed to have a life. Carol looks around and sees various scorch marks on the walls and there's especially one that looks like a human being where the girl just was. She then looks around and sees that the entire place is in shambles. She turns around with her uniform on, wrapping up Kyle in her power. Just who the hell are you? Carol, what, what are you doing? I'm Kyle. I don't believe Kyle would come back to Earth without telling me, or come back without me feeling it, and I definitely don't believe that he would take his ring off. So Kyle makes a white ring appear on his hand. Carol, I, I have the ring on. You need to let me go. Forming a ring out of your skin is not doing a lot to convince me that you are actually Kyle in front of me. So Kyle begins to form his uniform around him, but it's not the White Lantern's outfit that we're used to. This one is a black version with a White Lantern symbol on his chest. He breaks out of her bonds and he tells her, I'm not sure what's wrong with you, but I'll make it right. I can fix anything. She then blasts him through the chest, and he acts unfazed. It's okay. It's okay. I can make it right. Meanwhile, deep in space, Kyle is fighting it out with space sharks and space squids. And Kyle comments about how this isn't right. Someone is changing them, altering them. Space sharks are already rare, and space squids don't exist. The Guardians explain that whatever altered the very makeup of these creatures is beyond them. There's something new out there and they notice a nearby space station is completely void of life when it shouldn't be. But before they can resolve this mystery, Kyle gets a very bad feeling. There is something wrong with Carol. The Guardians tell him that he can't go though, not until they find these makers that the God Killers spoke of, the ones that had a hand in these missing people and the space squids. But Kyle isn't going to be stopped. This is Carol, and he leaves at light speed. He arrives back on Earth going right to where Carol is, which is oddly Arizona, the home of Kyle's father. More shockingly is that there's an energy field around his hometown. When he tries to scan it, he loses control of his ring and he falls through the energy field, landing in front of his father's shop. He then looks down at his hand and he's literally coming apart at the seams. Coming apart! I need to stop this! Carol floats down in front of him. Yeah, we do. 
She explains that whoever this is is constantly changing everything. Originally, they were in New York with Kyle's apartment, but now they're in Arizona with Kyle's hometown. Regardless of what he's doing, he believes Carol is supposed to be there, so she can't leave. She then looks at Kyle as he's unfading and tells him, Stay real, Kyle. Stay here. You're with me. But something is overcoming him. He falls to the ground, chanting, I'm not real. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Kyle, you need to feel it. So she gives him a big kiss, and he feels what's real. Now that he's in the right state of mind, he looks around and he realizes he can't see the people. But Carol tells him to relax. She shows him his father. She kept him safe. And then Kyle turns to her. I'm about to find out who he is, aren't I? And behind them is Kyle? It's the evil Kyle, draped in a black version of the White Lantern uniform, and surrounded by the incorrect versions of all of Kyle's friends. It's all wrong! Everything is wrong! But don't worry. Evil Kyle wants to make it right. They both fly straight up and stare at each other. It's my face! Evil Kyle tells him, but Kyle asks him, what did he do to these people? And Evil Kyle explains, they weren't right. I'm trying to fix them. So Kyle tells him, they aren't his to fix. That's his life down there. And Evil Kyle slaps him away. This is your fault. You took everything that's supposed to be mine. You did this. And he blasts Kyle with a barrage of energy. Kyle hits the ground and he feels the energy hitting him again. So Carol hits the evil Kyle with her power. The building and the people begin to melt and fall apart around them as the evil version of Kyle is beginning to get filled with the red power of rage. And that's when his father steps forward. Stop! But evil Kyle turns the power to his father and Kyle has to jump in to save him. I'm ending this. And then he hits the evil version of himself with the white power of life. The evil version vanishes and Kyle embraces his father. But everything begins to melt all over again. And Kyle begins to feel weak because it isn't over. The evil version grows to the size of a building. Carol gets Kyle's father and the civilians out of the way, while Kyle uses the white power of life to create a giant version of himself to grab the evil version. The evil version's long tongue is swinging in the wind as he throws a building at Kyle. I know what has to happen now. He then charges at Kyle. I have to consume you. I need to be whole. Kyle creates a giant white mecha construct and he begins to bombard his evil version, but the evil version flies right up to Kyle and he begins filling him with darkness, using tentacles to start pumping darkness into Kyle. So Kyle explodes into white light. Carol runs from the scene as quickly as she can, pulling all of the civilians with her, and they barely get out of range as the white light's explosion envelops the area. Once the smoke clears, things are even worse because the source wall has formed around the entire city and Kyle's face is popping out all over it. As a voice in Carol's head explains that he went beyond the source wall during the fight with Relic and it's been haunting him ever since. He has seen creation and the face of where everything began, the source but he couldn't remember what he saw. Now, Kyle knows what this is, what this evil version of him is. It's oblivion. He is Kyle. When Kyle went beyond the source wall, it changed him. And beyond the source wall, Kyle saw everything. The operating codes to all of reality. It was his anxiety, his fears, anger, everything that nodded his mind, given form. It became oblivion, the evil version of himself. And now he knows the answer is not to fight because he has finally realized why he's getting more and more powerful recently. He's been doing it subconsciously. When he wants something, he has the ability to rewrite the codes of reality, the codes of life itself. But the possibilities are so endless that he has been losing himself in the engine of creation. And with that message to Carol, Kyle closes the source wall and he vanishes from existence because he needs to end this himself. But Kyle's not dead or removed from existence like Carol thinks. He actually wakes up in an empty world all alone. He has no idea where he is, so he explores and he realizes that he is now in a dead world and he can feel the people that were once on this dead world. He feels sympathy for the dead. He's not sure if that's the indigo power of compassion amped up to 11 or a new white light power. He panics and he runs for the hills of this planet and then he turns around to see that life is growing on this dead world with his every footstep. He is life and he's needed. So he has a hunch, and he flies to the center of this planet. He understands where he is now. It's a living planet like Mogo, and he finds the planet's heart, and he hits it with the power of life, reviving it from the dead. He then asks if the planet is alive again, and the planet thanks him. So Kyle asks for its story. It tells him that it is a living planet, and it made friends with a race of beings that resided here. He helped them, and he provided. They took all they could, and they left him bare. So he killed them all. He had to prevent them from taking everything from him. He had to prevent his own death. 
The planet then tries to burn Kyle and throw him to the surface where it hits him with lightning strikes because it explains that the Green Lantern planet Mogo, his brother, destroyed him for his actions. That is who killed this planet. The planet continues to try and crush and swallow Kyle because it doesn't trust the lanterns. And Kyle begs for it to stop. Don't make him do this. In the end, Kyle needs to fly back down to the center of this world and take the life that he granted it. And then he flies off into space between oblivion, giving life, and taking life. He understands what the problem is. His power is too great and he has no idea what he's doing with it. How do you just become a godlike being? What do you do with the power of creation? But what about Carol and the Guardians? Well, the Guardians arrive on Earth looking for their White Lantern. They have their own emergency. Their brother Karos, that left us in the last adventure, sent out a distress call. They want Kyle. But Carol asks them, is that because something awful is coming? It's time for Kyle's solo journey to come to an end soon, as he finally meets the Makers. Recently, one of the Guardians left Kyle, Carol, and the new Guardians. Quaros went on his own adventure to discover the meaning of life itself. And right now he's on a planet telling a poor alien to be quiet before they get abducted. He's here watching billions of aliens get abducted directly from their homes. And he charges at the ship shouting, I will not allow this! So the ship above moves every one of its beams to him. And even he can't stop it anymore. It begins to pull him to the ship. Show yourself, Makers! Show me what you are! He shouts as they pull him helplessly into the ship. Yes, we will show you. The rest of the New Guardians arrive on this world much later to try and get their clues. Carol wants to help them, but she's telling them Kyle is missing also. Why aren't they looking for him as well? And one of the Guardians tell her, Kyle is powerful enough to defend himself. If he's in trouble, they would feel it. So the Guardians use their powers to link with their brother and try to get answers as to his whereabouts, and they're immediately blown back by his psychic energies. They can tell that he is suffering. Quaros is strapped to a machine, one that is literally tearing him limb from limb. The new Guardians and Carol go to the location of the Maker's ship, and without even considering a plan, they go directly inside with Carol telling them this is a very bad idea. Being desperate is making them dumb. Inside, they find creatures that are altered, their bloody limbs lying on the ground, and they can tell that these beings have the molecular coherence that they saw in Zal the Goddess. They go deeper and they find more mutilated aliens, still alive, asking for help, and creatures attached to machines. The Guardians begin to panic. These beings cannot be allowed to mutilate a Guardian of the Universe. One of the altered creatures begins to close up around them, trapping the Guardians, and Carol begins to panic herself. She knew this was a bad idea. The poor creature is apologizing. She can't help it. They did this to her. Then a bright white light appears next to her, and Kyle appears out of nowhere. I missed you too. Kyle! So what the hell is going on, and what the hell is that? Carol asks Kyle what happened to him after Arizona when he fought Oblivion, and he tells her, after Arizona, when I destroyed Oblivion, by doing whatever it is I did, I woke up on a living planet that had gone insane and I revived it and then I had to kill it again and it really wasn't fun for me. And then I tried to find you and now this. Carol just stares at him. Are you gonna slap me or something? Anything, Carol? And then she jumps on him, giving him another passionate kiss. That's better than slapping. They get to work flying deeper into the ship and Kyle pushes out the power of life to see what they're dealing with. But it confuses him because he's reading everything and nothing at the same time. Meanwhile, the Guardians are being tortured and attached to machines, drained of their life force, and Zala shouts with blood spewing out of her mouth, WE WILL DESTROY YOU! But another Guardian tells them, enough is enough. But it isn't. The High has looked and seen that you have forgotten. We have not. We have only done what you would have us do. We have learned. We have only done as asked. We have made ourselves better. Don't touch me! What are you doing? Why are you doing this? The Guardian asks the creature known as a maker. To become better. We are many, but we each walk a path of perfection together to become worthy of you, our creators. The Templar Guardians all look in shock. Carol and Kyle rocket through the ship looking at the maker's experiments in horror. Creatures torn apart, creatures combined together, creatures turned into nothing but hands or nothing but heads with eyeballs. Carol freaks out on the cells. No, 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 no! But back with the Makers and the Guardians, he refuses to believe that they could have created these creatures. The Makers tell their tale. They were aliens, unintelligent aliens, until the Guardians arrived and experimented on them. They changed them. They made them what they are now. 
But once the Guardians left them alone, they felt abandoned, and they knew what they needed to do. It was a test to check their worthiness, to complete what the Guardians had started. The Makers then traveled around the galaxy, continuing the Guardians' work in hopes of becoming worthy. Over with Carol and Kyle, they continue to fly through the ship looking for the Makers, and eventually, they find Quaros, the Lost Guardian, strapped to the ceiling, machines hooked into every part of his body, and his brain removed! Red rage begins to flare up in Kyle, but he calms down. This is what they wanted. They wanted us to see this. This is it! Do you hear me? The experiments end! Then one of the Makers lowers itself to Kyle. You are correct. It is time for this particular experiment to come to an end. The Guardians begin tapping into each other's minds, and Palco explains what he has learned. That they made these things long ago, and this is their fault. While there are limits to their power, they need to do whatever they can while the leader is occupied by Kyle and Carol. So Kyle starts making constructs to begin the battle while Carol asks if this is the boss, because normally the biggest one is the boss. The Makers see Kyle's hard light construct technology, and they realize they need it for themselves. But he notices that it absorbs his constructs due to a very weird looking object powering the Maker's device. Ping. A mother box. Kyle tells Carol to find the Guardians to get some additional support on this while he rages out, putting all of his red powers to work! Meanwhile, the Guardians have used this distraction to break out of their bonds and head in Carol's direction while she makes a detour into the Organic Archive to free all of the prisoners. The Makers jump in to continue their battle with Kyle, telling him that it is interesting that he fights, and he tells them that it's interesting that they don't stop talking. Do you not seek perfection? Do you not follow the Maker's path? You have the power within you to reshape the universe and the drive to do so. In response, Kyle hits the Maker with everything, and then he stops. The Maker is unfazed by the blast and asks, you have ceased fighting, you can't have given up. With a smile, Kyle tells him, Nope. Then a blast of guardian power hits the Maker! Just wanted them to have a chance to get a piece of you. Where is our brother, Kyle? You don't want to see this. Where, Kyle? Then Zala sees him, Quaros, her brother, in pieces. Oh no, 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 no. Not only is he in pain, but he is still alive and conscious. He tells his brother to get out of the ship. He is interfaced with it in this state, and he can save them all. With tears in her eyes, Zala refuses to leave her brother. We have no option, sister. I do not want to leave you, but we must destroy this place. It will not make right what our brothers did, what the Scions did, but we can save thousands. Kyle stops them. No! You can't kill all these prisoners. We can save everyone, you included. No, Kyle. What the Scions did broke their minds. They only know suffering. Quaros puts a willpower bubble around his brothers, sisters, Kyle and Carol, and he shoots them out of the ship to save them. Then they watch as the mother box pings and the ship explodes. The shields around them begin to fade and Zala cries knowing what this means for Quaros, knowing that he's gone from this world. Kyle is just looking at his friends, the Guardians. And Carol asks him, are you? Are you? I don't know. It's way too soon for us to be finishing each other's sentences. I do know that. I don't know if they're gonna be all right. I can feel what they're feeling. Their despair is like a distant echo. It's deafening. One thing survived the explosion of the ship, though. One thing going ping and sending off a signal. A mother box. A device of the new gods and Darkseid himself. Who do you think it's calling? In the beginning was the void. Then from the darkness of the deep erupted the energy of the deep. Out of this tumult formed the heavens, a multiverse filled with glittering stars. Amid the multiverse firmament, the dust gathered and was shaped into a world, where waters boiled with light and from the light sprang life. The old gods ruled all that they saw, but that was not enough if they had to share it. Darkness still clung to this new existence. Jealousy and pride had burrowed deep into their hearts. It cursed them, and they returned to the dust. Then. The new gods rose. God against God, there was no personal vendetta, but a battle for the soul of the cosmos, an army of light against that of darkness. After seven days of war, there was more dead than living, so the new gods sulked back into the multiverse. High Father and his side built new genesis high above the world that they had destroyed, while Dark Side and his ilk built Apocalypse. 
One would search for the life equation, while another would search for the anti-life equation. And thus began their search throughout the entire multiverse. And the High Father was brought to the Source Wall to speak with the greatest knowledge beyond the wall. But he was unable to pass through. In the beginning, there was the Word, and the Word was the Source. But today, the High Father and Metron see something new. A new being has been trapped within the wall. When Metron uses their technology to speak with the being, he starts in ramblings and nonsense. His name is Relic. His universe lost its emotional spectrum, and he came to this one to save it. But the lightsmiths of this universe, no, the lanterns of this universe, united and defeated him, with one going through the wall after him. High Father is speechless. A being in this universe went through the wall? Metron, do you know of these lanterns? Mortals. They channel energy through their rings and waste it on trivial purposes. They know not the power that they wield if those rings can pass through the wall. It can only mean that these mortals possess the ultimate weapon. Over in Sector Zero, Hal Jordan and Kilowog are looking through their computers when Hal remembers. It's been a year. He flies off to the graves of the Fallen Lanterns where he finds John in front of Kyle's tombstone. They both remember that Kyle was always the light that would shine the brightest. And in the distance, St. Walker is watching his friends, remembering that he wasn't there when Kyle sacrificed himself. He doesn't feel hope anymore and he can't wear his own ring, though it does seem to follow him. And Mogo, the planet lantern everyone is on, asks Walker, Do you not find White Lantern Kyle Rayner inspiring? But he doesn't. Over on New Genesis, Orion hears a boom as a boom tube opens behind him. It's the High Father and he has a mission for his generals. There are these rings in this universe. They have the power to access the life equation. So he wants seven of them. So each of them needs to get him one of the rings. While his eighth general builds him a device to access the combined power of these rings. The generals do not question the High Father and they get to work. On the home world of the Sinestro Corps, a new god general named Becca appears telling Sinestro, your yellow ring, you will give it to me. Or, that was not a question. And she throws him aside as she disables the other yellow lanterns and cuts off Arkillo's fingers, taking his ring. Then boom, she leaves. Over on Okara, the homeworld of Larflees, another general appears and he begins to fight the orange constructs, telling Larflees, he only needs the ring. This could be so much easier. Mine, mine, the ring is mine. It is the only one. So the beast snatches it off of Larflees' finger and leaves. On Zamarion, the homeworld of the Star Sapphires, a speedster zips through the planet, taking one of their rings, and simply leaves. On Nock, the homeworld of the Indigo Tribe, another general takes a member's ring through his pleading that it'll turn him back into a monster. And as the general leaves, the Indigo member gets a grin on his face. He is now free of compassion. And on Earth, a woman completely incinerates her tormentors before flying over to the new god general and giving him her red ring. She got her vengeance and now wants to die. The ring theft continues as Orion appears on Mogo and he sees Saint Walker with the only blue ring. Realizing that he is on a living planet, Orion wonders if it'll put up a good fight. But it isn't much of one as he takes Saint Walker and Mogo's rings before trying to leave. Hal sees him and before he can leave, he tries to hold Orion back. But Orion shatters Hal's constructs and throws him against the wall before boom tubing out. Then Mogo goes dormant with no life left in him. The new gods have succeeded in getting every one of the rings and the High Father holds it over his subjects. They have the life equation and can finally defeat Darkseid and bring order to the multiverse. They can reshape this universe into a trap for Darkseid. So the moment he appears, they will have everyone waiting to defeat him. But they need to test this first. So they go to a planet destined to fail. A world consumed by its own greed, poverty, overpopulation, starvation, and sickness. The High Father unleashes the power of the life equation on the planet, changing them into something better, hopefully. They feel the full force of every emotion in the emotional spectrum, and they do begin to change, but into monsters, creatures, beasts that suffer. They have not created new gods, but monsters. So the High Father decrees, the planet will be slaughtered out of mercy. They cannot be allowed to suffer. He looks at his device, trying to figure out why it failed, and Metron suggests, maybe they don't need to combine the power but the rings into a central white ring. A white ring? Well, if one exists, then it holds the life equation within it, and it is the ultimate power in the universe. By whatever means necessary, I will use this power against Darkseid.
Over on Mogo, Hal is trying his best to figure out what just happened. Mogo has gone dormant and their systems are reading an entire planet was just exposed to a massive amount of spectrum power. Two planet-sized problems for the core to handle. And that's when the new gods begin to trace back the rings to read its information and try to figure out the answer to the White Lantern. Just as Hal and Kilowog are sitting there trying to figure out their problems, they see someone trying to access the core's computers. Their first reaction is to sever the connection, but Hal tells them not to. These computers have 10 billion years of knowledge in them. There's no way that these guys are after all of it. There must be a specific thing that they are searching for. That's when they see their goal, the White Lantern. Hal also countertraces their signal to find out Metron's current location. That's when he takes half the core to go meet them. They arrive with Orion, Metron, and a small sliver of the New God Army standing there waiting. He approaches them, demanding that they give themselves up and come back with the Green Lantern Corps to Mogo. Orion starts the fight sucker punching Hal, and that starts the one-sided battle of the Lanterns versus New Genesis, and it's a bloodbath. The constructs are useless against the New God's army, and after they kill a good chunk of the Lanterns, the army of New Genesis gets bored and decides to boom tube back to New Genesis. At first, Hal demands the Green Lanterns chase them, but Salak tells him, look through the portal. It's an entire army. Hal realizes this potential problem, and he sends an order to all of the Lanterns to leave Mogo and go to the last place a green would go. Knock, the world of the Indigo Lanterns, because Mogo is dormant and there's no way he can protect them. Meanwhile, John has brought a group of Lanterns to the planet changed by Highfather. He asks his ring what happened, and it tells him the entire planet was hit with every energy. Red, orange, yellow, green. I get it. The curious part is that they can't find anyone on the planet, living or dead until one leaps out of a building and drops him to the ground. The Lanterns easily put this monster in a construct cage, but then it breaks out and it goes in to kill a Lantern when it's suddenly dropped to the ground dead. Standing there is a general of New Genesis, and he explains that this is their doing. They are showing mercy with swift blows to the back of the head. He explains that their plans did not work because the rings are flawed. Not the new gods, they are gods. He then demands that John and his Green Lanterns give up their rings. They are far too dangerous for mere mortals. John responds by putting handcuffs onto the general, and the general breaks out with ease and then grabs John by the throat. Left and right, the Lanterns try their hardest to battle against the new gods, but the new gods shatter and dispose of the constructs easily. So John tells his team to get off the planet. He'll finish them, and he wraps chains around the buildings nearby, and then he pulls them down on top of the general and himself. He got out just in time when he caught up with his team, but the whole thing was pointless as the general boom tubes right next to them. All hope seems lost until Indigo One teleports in behind them to tell them to join her. The war has begun. Meanwhile, across space, the Templar Guardians are explaining the situation to Kyle Rayner. He isn't dead. He's been in hiding ever since he touched the source. Lanterns around the universe are under attack by beings older than the Guardians because of what Kyle did. It was supposed to be impossible. They explain that when Kyle went through the wall and came back, he took the life equation with him. That is how he has been capable of so many feats. Because of that, Kyle is now a target. That's why you wanted me hidden? That's why you wanted me to let my friends think I was dead? Not because of the reservoir, but because of me? You have to understand, Kyle. We weren't sure, we only had a theory. We couldn't risk anyone knowing. You couldn't risk my knowing? You lied to me. You made me a liar. We did not force you. No, you lied, misled, and manipulated until you got what you wanted. Carol steps in. Who does that sound like, Kyle? Wait, how did you know about the situation with the cores? We tapped into their communications. You are spying on the cores? Kyle chuckles at the idea. <laughs> of course they did. Why not? They were supposed to be better than the last Guardians. They were supposed to be different. Then Kyle lifts off the ground. I'm going back to save my friends, but the Templar Guardians get in his face. We cannot allow that and they bombard him with their power. What are you doing, Carol shouts. That's Kyle! The power within Kyle cannot be allowed in this universe. We had hoped for Kyle's help in returning it, but if you won't, we will remove it ourselves. They then continue to hit Kyle with their power, and he hits the ground telling them, stop, stop! He shouts as an explosion of white power comes out of him more than ever before. He begins to ulcer the very universe around him, showing all versions of the multiverse and life itself. And to make matters worse, he can't control it. That's when the new gods get a ping on their radar of the power of life and they boom tube there. The High Father steps forward and tells Kyle, enough, please. This is not a power mortals are meant to have. Is that not clear to you? You nearly drove the universe into extinction with your use of the emotional spectrum. Now you dare use the life equation? Is there any doubt how this will end? 
High Father reaches out and he places a hand on Kyle's shoulder, absorbing the power of life into himself, helping redirect it, and then he throws the power off into space. All of the multiversal possibilities showing as it goes. The Templar Guardians fly in telling High Father they can't allow this, and he teleports them away. Carol looks at him. You attacked the cores. Yes. I am seeking to protect all of the universes. This is my duty and my honor. The actions of your cores almost ended this universe prematurely. A threat I should have been made aware of, but was not. Perhaps I acted harshly when I sent my generals to obtain the rings so that I might understand them. I did not think merely asking them would have resulted in my obtaining them. Was I mistaken? The High Father then opens a boom tube back to New Genesis, and he invites Kyle to join him to better understand the White Ring. Kyle looks into Carol's eyes. This is the only chance I have. And Carol looks into Kyle's eyes. I will follow you anywhere. If this is what you want, I trust you. They kiss passionately with what could possibly be their last, and they enter blindly into the boom tube. If only High Father's intentions were as proper as he was making them out to be, because we saw with John that his troops are taking all of the Lantern Rings. Across the universe, back on Earth, Guy Gardner is trying to relax after his Red Lantern Civil War, when members of the New God's army appear before him to take his ring by force. He tries to hold his own, but the New Genesis army is wrecking his power and draining his ring at a rapid rate. As they come in to kill Guy Gardner, Simon Baz comes into his rescue, explaining what's happening. That there is an army here trying to kill all Lanterns, and they need to leave now. Simon tells them that they don't stand a chance. Lantern power doesn't work. Guy tells them they don't run. Lanterns don't run. Luckily, the new Genesis General gets a call to return. They have the White Lantern. They leave Guy and Simon there. Elsewhere, Sinestro and his army are trying to figure out a plan of attack, because oddly, Sinestro seems to be obsessed with the woman that attacked him. He has Lyssa track the woman, and Lyssa finds her assaulting the homeworld of the Indigo Lanterns, Nock, the location that all of the Green Lanterns fled to. On Nock, the Greens and the Indigo tribe are getting their butts handed to them, so Sinestro sends in his core to help repel the army. But they are also dying all over the planet's surface. It's a hopeless endeavor. But Sinestro knew this going in. He had decided that the Sinestro core had grown bloated, and he wanted to weed out his numbers. As they appeared to be losing, he ordered Arkillo and his squad to leave the planet, taking the Greens and the Indigo tribe with him. Then, Sinestro detonated the remaining members of his core's rings, stalling the armies of New Genesis. As everyone fled, Becca looks up, sacrificing those loyal to you. For you, Sinestro, only damnation waits! In the beginning, there were the old gods, but once they fell to their own nature, the new gods arose, and a battle between light and dark began. High Father versus Dark Side. They were never able to defeat each other, and things were always at a standstill. Until now. The High Father has taken his army to the universe of the Lantern Corps to see what this power is that they wield. And once he discovered how powerful it was, he set his troops forth to kill and claim every Lantern Ring. No mortals should wield that power. Kyle Rayner, the wielder of the White Ring, has gone to New Genesis to learn how to control his powers, as he is unaware of the High Father's decree against all Lanterns. Hal Jordan is leading the Green Lanterns that were not on the Green Lantern homeworld to the home of the Sinestro Corps, and he realizes that the only way for them to even stand a chance against beings that can shatter constructs is to team up with Sinestro. As they approach Lyssa, Sinestro's council tells him that the Green Lanterns are now upon the world, and it is his daughter Sorenik to blame. But as they begin to argue, Sinestro tells them both to be quiet while he welcomes the Green Lanterns. Sorenik gets to work trying to patch up the injured Green Lanterns, and Sinestro goes to Hal just as the Templar Guardians that were keeping Kyle's secret arrive. They explain that the New Gods now have the most powerful of the Lanterns, the White Lantern. Hal is confused. He thought Kyle was dead, and Sinestro wants to know how Kyle is the most powerful. The Templar Guardians explain that they have kept Kyle in hiding because he obtained the life equation. Saiyan Walker hears that his friend is alive and he runs forward to hear of Kyle's survival himself and the Guardians explain. They were just trying to save Kyle from himself, from what he could become, the end of everything. Hal is even more confused. You drop out out of nowhere and tell me that my friend is alive, but bad news, you've misplaced him? We're at war and we could have used your help. We know you were at war, Hal Jordan. How do you know that? I haven't seen you in a year. That is for another time. Hal thinks about it, the new gods have each ring, red, yellow, green, sapphire, orange, blue, and indigo, and now they have a white ring. There is only one ring that they don't have, and the guardians stop him right there. We will not allow you to do that, Hal Jordan. It is madness. And they demand that he find a new solution. So he walks into Sinestro's chambers to try and figure this out when Sinestro joins him. Hal, you did well because you were unpredictable. That's why I can never kill you. Any plotter or schemer in my path, I will crush. But I can't predict you, Hal Jordan. 
Sinestro decides that he will move everyone to the antimatter universe of Quard and hide them there. While he does that, Hal should do what he shouldn't do, what no one is predicting. Go get the Black Ring of Death. All the way over on Earth, Black Hand has an army of zombies enacting a circus for him, everything from Harry Houdini to the Flying Graysons, and the police are too scared to walk in and stop him. So they stand outside, preventing the zombies from escaping until Hal Jordan arrives. Black Hand gets ready to fight against Hal, but he tells him, I'm not here to stop you. I want you to take this show on the road, Black Hand. The rest of Sinestro, Indigo, and Green Corps all go to Quard as the Star Sapphires are being invaded by the new gods. But as they enter Quard, the Guardians ask, where is Hal Jordan? Sinestro looks at them. Your great leader that led dozens of lanterns to their deaths is off to raise reinforcements. He went for Black Hand after we forbade it. He's playing with forces too dangerous, too uncontrollable. But that is a matter we must address later. We need to rescue Kyle Rayner before they can turn him into a weapon. Sinestro informs them, the home of the new gods is beyond our reach. The Indigo tribe can't teleport us there. So forget Rayner, I will do what we must. Enough, Jon Stewart shouts, interrupting the arguing. They need to rescue whatever hues of the spectrum remain. Sinestro suggests that they rally the Star Sapphires as they are still at full strength, but John tells them that they can't trust the Star Sapphires. Recently, John's lover turned out to be a shapeshifter pretending to love him, and then he found out that the real fatality was forced to love him because of her ring. But he's quickly convinced that they can't leave that planet there to get wiped out, and then Sinestro walks them all over to the Weaponeer for new weapons. Ones that can fight the new gods, weapons built out of the shattered remains of the old White Lantern rings a sword and shield. Sorenic tries to talk to John about his feelings, but he still can't believe what happened to him with the Star Sapphires. But when she tries to talk to him, he snaps at her. I'm not a victim, and he leaves her battle. Meanwhile, over on Xamaron, the Star Sapphires are already embroiled in a war with the new gods when the Indigo tribe teleports John and his new weapons there. He stares down the new gods in general. The white light that caught the eye of you new gods, it's a blade that cuts both ways, and he jumps in swinging. While John is battling him out, Kilowog tells the Zamarions to get everyone. They are leaving ASAP. The Weaponeer and John begin beating on the general, smashing her helmet and revealing it to be the new god Artemis. And she has her soldiers fire a net over the entire group before they can escape. But it's not a normal weapon. The moment John tries to cut through it with his new white light sword, it breaks. Their rescue mission is a failure due to a simple net. But John asks the Sapphires. They can teleport to their true loves. Can't they take everyone with them? But sadly, they can't. They'll just go chasing their loves across the universe and leave everyone else trapped here. Then one of the dying members of the Corps has an idea to give her ring to John. Disgusted, he replies with, I would rather die. Not after you brainwashed Fatality and forced her to love me. But they explain that in order for Fatality to love him, she needed to have that love in her heart already. The ring floats off the Sapphire's finger and over to John where he eyeballs it and accepts it. John Stewart of Earth, you have great love in your heart. Welcome to the Star Sapphires. He then points his ring into the air. For God, country, and the core. And with his love for the core, he grabs everyone within the net and he pulls them back to the core's headquarters. As they flee, Artemis' soldiers ask her why she didn't shoot the ring out of the air. She could have totally done that. She could have stopped this from happening. And she tells them, it doesn't matter. They'll all be converts soon. Meanwhile, over on New Genesis, a boom tube opens and Highfather steps through while Kyle and Carol follow him. They have no idea of the events that are transpiring everywhere else, and the Highfather has promised that he will help Kyle control the White Ring. Highfather walks Kyle over to a machine and he informs him that he can't separate the life equation from the ring, but he can remove the ring from Kyle's finger. Kyle kisses Carol when she objects, telling her he has to. He can't risk the universe. He won't risk Carol. So he puts his hand into the device, and in a blinding flash of light, it is removed and placed into the hands of the High Father. He takes it and puts it into his device, and as Carol picks up Kyle off of the ground, she asks High Father, will he return the rings that he stole now? Stolen? Those rings are not stolen. That would imply legitimacy of your stewardship that never existed. Those rings are rightfully mine, as I have sent for them for further study. If you aren't giving them back, what are you going to do? Save the multiverse. He then shows Kyle and Carol his scepter with the white ring inside of it. I will use the life equation to remake your universe beginning with Earth. I will prepare it for the war with Darkseid. No, you said yourself that no one person should have that power. No one should decide for everyone. And as she says this, Carol bombards the High Father with the power of her ring. Everything she has draining it faster and faster. And she tells Kyle to think of something fast. She can't keep doing this. But this is all a part of the High Father's plan because her ring reaches zero. And then he uses the white ring to cast them out of his chambers down to the barren world of old Genesis, their old planet. Kyle Rayner and Carol Ferris are no longer of any use to him. They are both now stranded in a foreign universe with no rings, no power, and no way home. But the High Father isn't done. He walks to a city where he holds up the new scepter to its willing participants, and he tries to change them into the new god's army. 
and it works. He changes an entire city into the willing soldiers of his army. He has ultimate power! Meanwhile, Guy Gardner and Simon Baz are still on Earth wondering what they should do next. And Guy, in his infinite wisdom, decides that he doesn't care if he's gonna die. He's gonna fight against these things. So they argue with Cyborg and they convince him to use his boom tube to warp them to New Genesis following the energy signature of one of the generals that attacked them. But once they boom tube the New Genesis, they quickly learn their mistake as they arrive in the bedroom of the soldier that attacked them. After a few hits, they are both unconscious and they wake up in the miracle cell of New Genesis. While this is happening, Sinestro is taunting Becca in deep space as a yellow construct, and they have a not-so-nice debate about the purpose of the Lanterns and the New Gods, but he does admit that he is following her because he enjoys watching her work. And this is because she is worthy of a yellow ring. Becca of New Genesis, you have the ability to instill great fear. And she looks at the ring, but this hasn't been the only thing Sinestro has been tracking. He's been tracking all of the new gods in this universe, and John plans to use the Indigo Tribe to teleport every single one of them to the soldiers so that they can steal a mother box and warp in right on top of the New Genesis army. So, they all teleport off to the soldiers, but it's not where they were expecting to go. In the middle of a puff of smoke, they realize that Indigo One and her tribe betrayed them. They have been warped right into the middle of an ambush. The High Father now has the power of the White Lantern, and he plans to change the universe of the Green Lanterns into a universe capable of fighting Darkseid. He plans to literally change the universe, strip it free of its free will, and make it an army against Darkseid. Kyle and Carol have been stripped of their powers, and they've been thrown to the planet's surface to rot, and Jonas and Sinestro are imprisoned on New Genesis. Even with the power of Parallax, the very entity of fear they can't get out. Guy Gardner and Simon Baz are also imprisoned by one of Highfather's generals for being stupid enough to chase him to New Genesis. And Hal Jordan, our only hope that remains? He went to Earth to see the one man that might be able to help. Black Hand, the wielder of the Black Lantern Ring. Hal tries to convince Hand to come and save the universe, but Hand tells him the universe always needs saving. Why is this different? Hal explains that the life equation was stolen. That perks up Black Hand. That doesn't sound good. I need as many people as you can get me, Hand. We need to make an army. That sounds like a war. Not a war, Hand. The war. That perks up his interest finally, and they both fly off into space with Hand declaring, SPACE WAR! Now show me where I can kill some gods. They fly to the Source Wall, where Sinestro was supposed to meet them, and Black Hand is impressed with the architecture. The face is forever frozen in fear on it. Hal is confused, though. Where are Sinestro and John? That's when Orion stops by to say hello with an army of his own. Hal throws up a willpower-based wall to block them, while Black Hand stares at the wall, asking, Is the space war behind the wall? Hal snaps at him. Focus his hand! Orion then smashes the shields. Well, I didn't fly all this way not to kill something. Black Hand tells Hal and Orion, and he summons an army of fallen Green Lanterns to assist. Hal is horrified at the idea of this, and the new gods begin blasting their way through the army of the dead. At first, the New Genesis guards can cut them down, but eventually, the New Genesis guys are overwhelmed by the guards and begin getting dragged to the source wall. Then, one of the guards' cape touches the wall to become a part of the wall, forever entombed in never-ending death. And Black Hand realizes, the wall isn't a wall. It's death, a mass grave. Back on New Genesis, High Father hands Indigo One the Indigo Ring as payment for betraying everyone. It's because of her that Sinestro and John and everyone with them are now captured on New Genesis. He then begins dropping lanterns a few at a time in front of him, and he turns them against their will into his followers, stripping them of their personality and willpower, turning them into members of the New Genesis army. He then opens up John and Sinestro's cell, dropping them in front of him. Both get ready to fight, preparing their biggest constructs, but the now mindless follower lanterns grab them and hold them still. John is shocked that the High Father would strip people of their personalities, willpower, and their free will. And High Father explains that his plan is to use this universe. It is the only one ever able to defeat Darkseid, and due to that, he will return. High Father wants to go to Earth and change everyone there, including its champions, into the ultimate weapons against Darkseid. Then he prepares to bombard Sinestro John and their friends with the white light, when one of High Father's generals, Maladrone, steps forward taking the blast. High Father is appalled that someone that he saved from Darkseid and made a general of his would do this to him. But he explains that he left Darkseid because he couldn't see people become mindless followers anymore. And then he boom tubes out of there with Sinestro John and Saint Walker at his side. 
He explains that this is all he could do with his mother box. It won't survive long from that blast. But if they can get another mother box, they can boom tube themselves around. While Sinestro goes off in his own plan, John runs back out onto the battlefield, steals a weapon dropping one of the guards, and then grabs themselves a mother box before booming out of there. This insurgency is only getting warmed up, John says as they leave. Meanwhile, Kyle and Carol are on the surface of the planet, separated from everyone with no idea how to get back, when a new god arrives before them, Metron. He sits above them in his chair and he explains that the balance is shifted. While he will not help them, he will leave them something that will allow them to help themselves. A mother box with one charge. Using the boom tube, Kyle and Carol end up over by John St. Walker and Melodrone, and everyone is overjoyed to see the friend that they thought was dead. You see, everyone thought Kyle was dead ever since Relic attacked this universe. It's been a year. St. Walker, his dearest friend, is the most overjoyed. He is one of Kyle's greatest friends. Everyone embraces and he explains what was going on. Then, before anything else can come out of their welcoming, the guards of New Genesis find them and they begin opening fire on the group. But Kyle notices something. No one is shooting at him. So he walks up to one of the guards and knocks him down, and as the guard is saying that they are not allowed to hurt the bearer, he then beats the guard down taking his spear weapon. He then turns to everyone, let's get my ring back! They run right to Highfather and they begin fighting him. John tries to hold Highfather with a construct, but of course he breaks out of it. St. Walker and Carol both begin to open fire on him with the spear's lasers and he blocks them. But then Kyle leaps in destroying his scepter and separating the white ring from it. He grabs the ring and he puts it on to Clarion. Let's see how you like fighting a white lantern. But nothing happens. The Highfather tells him that he is foolish. The ring is not needed. The life equation within it, the Highfather is the life equation. He then gains a White Lantern's appearance and he blasts them with a White Lantern gun, seemingly killing everyone. Meanwhile, Simon and Guy are in the Miracle Cell, a cell that if you do manage to escape from, will surely kill you. But Guy in his infinite wisdom charges his ring up for a massive blast to break out of their cell. As it explodes, Simon puts up a shield in a hurry and they take a massive hit from their cell. Simon then uses his willpower as far as it's ever gone before, breaking them out of the miracle cell, only to find Melodrone in front of them. He takes his helmet off and he explains everything to Guy and Simon that's been going on with Sinestro, John, and St. Walker. You see, Guy and Simon have been out of commission for a while. He then explains to Guy and Simon where all of the stolen rings are being kept, with Halt, the new Genesis blacksmith. Simon and Guy get into position and they begin their attack on Halt. Simon hits him with a full blast of willpower to which Halt returns fire with his hammer. Guy has a bit worse of a fight though, as he's getting involved with robots trying to fight him that have woken up within the forge and have begun detecting him as a contaminant. It throws Guy back and he gets full of rage. Contaminant? Screw you, pal! He then runs out to Simon and Holt fighting and spews his napalm blood on Holt, which seemingly weakens him. This gives Guy an idea and he places his napalm blood into the Green Lantern willpower footballs made by Simon. He then punts the bombs at the forge and Holt. As they escape, Guy shows their prize. The stolen lantern rings and the sapphire ring lifts up and carries itself off to its new user. Back with John, Carol, Kyle, and St. Walker, they've survived and they were teleported somewhere else. Then the Templar Guardians appear before them to inform them that it will be all of them who will save the day, not the Guardians. Sinestro is off on his own, trying to sneak through the city undetected, until he sees one of his old Yellow Lanterns changed by Highfather. He allows Parallax to envelop him and burns Devil Dog alive. Then he crushes the new Genesis soldier that saw it happen. Just at that moment, he sees a sapphire ring zip past him, so he decides to follow it and watches it land on Carol Ferris's finger. He stands before everyone laughing at the idea that the White Lantern will still save them. He wishes to prove his worth to the Guardians by flying straight to the High Father, trying to throw the fear of Darkseid in his face, only to be rejected. And Sinestro flees from the palace using the boom tube that the High Father's army has opened up allowing them to go to the Green Lantern's universe. Back at the source wall, Black Hand is looking at the corpses laid out in front of him, and he touches the wall, the very thing that traps individuals inside of it. He begins to feel the sand taking over his hands, and then he throws back his Black Lantern power and wakes the wall up! Everything that was trapped within the wall wakes up confused, but forced to do Black Hand's bidding. Rise! Black Hand calls, as even Relic himself wakes up. Orion sees his end coming. You may best us here, Lanterns, but without a boom tube, you aren't bringing this army to New Genesis. At that moment, the boom tube that Sinestro rode opens up next to them. You were saying? Hal Jordan, are you coming? Then Sinestro, Black Hand, and Hal dive into the boom tube, and Black Hand turns back to his army. Follow me, friends! So the wall of zombies begin to come through as well. Let's play!
Everything that was trapped within the walls begins to attack and destroy New Genesis. Some of them are even calling them the Wall Titans, as they are massive beings from the time before. And the High Father calls this madness. Hal tells Black Hand to keep the new army Genesis busy while they go after High Father himself, and Black Hand smiles. Over with John, Guy, and Simon, they all join the fight, but Carol stays with Kyle as the Guardians argue over telling Kyle the truth. They agree to and they approach him. High Father does not have the life equation. He has tapped into your mind to use it. It is still in your body and you will still die from it. On the battlefield, Black Hand begins to lose control of the beings that he raised from the dead because they are resurrecting. They are returning to life. And Black Hand's arms begin turning into the wall itself. He shouts, Hal Jordan, you knew this would do this to me! And he flies back through the open boom tube right past Relic that is staring at the now empty wall wondering what changed. With the Source Wall Titans stopping their onslaught due to confusion, the new Genesis army surrounds Sinestro and Hal. Over with Kyle, he knows what this means and after debating it and Carol trying to talk him out of it, Kyle goes into the recesses of his own mind to find the High Father there. While this is going on, John, Guy, and Simon go to the prison cells and they free the rest of the Lanterns. And as Hal Jordan is being taken by the army, he leans over and he shouts to the High Father, You are taking people's free wills! You are starting a war that will kill billions and all to create an army against Darkseid! Don't you get it? You are becoming Darkseid! The High Father stops and says, No, what have I done? The Source Titans keep crushing the city of New Genesis, killing thousands, and no one even knows who to fight anymore. It's only death and destruction over the entire city. Realizing that he needs to end this, the High Father goes back into the Mindscape, where he gives the Life Equation back to Kyle Rayner. You are worthy of the Life Equation. Prove it now, Kyle. Kyle wakes up with his powers returned. Source Titans? That doesn't sound good. Everyone take cover. He takes off into the sky and he bombards the planet's surface with the power of life. Saint Walker watches as his friend returns to full power. High Father is remorseful as he realizes the humans did what he could not. They saved everyone. The problem is that the Source Titans have damaged the anti-gravity device in the city, and New Genesis is now barreling down towards the planet's surface. Hal sees so much death coming, and he tells Sinestro that they need to save it, but Sinestro argues, It is time to take our win. Kyle begins to fall to the surface as every time that he bombards an area with life, he passes out. Carol catches him while the High Father orders the city to evacuate. Sinestro takes off for home, but Hal is not done yet. He flies beneath the city, literally catching it with a giant construct of himself. Hal will keep fighting until the end, even if it means saving his enemies. But it's not enough. He doesn't have the power to catch the entire city. Luckily, Saint Walker is filled with hope, thanks to seeing the White Lantern return, and his ring has sensed it. It declares, hope detected. And he declared, all will be well. He super juices Hal Jordan's ring to 300%, turning his miniature construct of himself into the size of the island itself. Then, using everything he has, he puts the city down gently before collapsing and having John catch him. He asks, is everyone safe, John? They're all right, Hal. Take it easy. High Father approaches Kyle and he tells him that he misjudged him. If this world is destined to be the final battleground of New Genesis and Apocalypse, then they have proven that they are worthy. Return to your world with my sincere regrets and know that we are adversaries no more. As they begin to leave, Guy comments, Is it just me or is the guy to girl ratio here on New Genesis a little skewed? Way to go, Guy. Always inappropriate at just the right time. Kyle then catches up with Hal to apologize for the whole Carol thing. Hal tells him, It's fine. I'm over it. Just treat her good. Otherwise, then I'll be pissed. Kyle tells him that Hal and Carol should talk, but Hal dismisses it. We will one day. Everyone boom tubes home where a simple forest critter takes Mogo's ring and it runs it over to his branch. The planet Mogo reawakens, thanking everyone. And the story of Godhead comes to an end. Kyle Rayner has had a crazy adventure as the White Lantern. He discovered that he had the power of the life equation within him and the ability to reshape reality itself. His own doubts and fears over this created an evil version of himself with the power of a god and the desire to destroy everything, Oblivion. While Oblivion went missing after their last conflict, Kyle met with the new gods, and after a conflict with them, he discovered that he was going to die from the life equation, and that no one man should have this power. Now that everything has calmed down, we go to Carol Ferris of the Star Sapphires, sitting on Xamaron, looking at her ring. Kyle flies over to her as she's sitting there. She tells him she wants to talk finally. After everything that they've been through, she wants to say she loves him, and that's her problem, because she also loves being a Star Sapphire and flying, and the space adventures, and the travel. They fly up into the air together, and he holds her close. Suddenly, 
they get a message that something massive is coming towards the planet. It's huge and flaming from entry into orbit. They both move out of the way in a hurry, but Kyle throws up a shield as it collides with the surface of the planet. Carol's ring reports no deaths on the planet, and then as the dust clears, they see what it is. It's one of the beings from the source wall that Black Hand awoke in the Godhead event, and it's been scorched with the White Lantern symbol. Someone is calling out Kyle. They follow the symbol back to a planet that's been destroyed, and they find the one surviving member of the alien race that once lived there. She is scared of Kyle because he is wearing the symbol of the White Lantern. It's a symbol to be feared on this planet, because Oblivion is here. He wraps around Kyle, enveloping him, swallowing him, telling him, this is the end. This is Oblivion. Kyle is trapped within Oblivion's makeup, and he decides to inform him. Kyle, you will tear the universe asunder. It's inevitable. You know this. That is why you created me. You call me Oblivion because you know the truth. The universe would be better without you. Kyle breaks free, hitting Oblivion across the face. You want to fight? You got one. On the outside of Oblivion, Oblivion is fighting against Carol, breaking through her shields and telling her that he can't escape his nature. Until the alien blasts him in the back with a gun. Oblivion grabs the alien and begins swirling around her, and Carol tries to fight against him until white light begins to pour out of Oblivion, and Kyle explodes out of him. Would you shut the hell up? Carol catches the alien and Kyle tells her to get out of here, go. She tells him that she isn't leaving him with this monster, but Kyle doesn't want her to go. She knows what she needs to do. So Carol takes the alien off world, leaving Kyle alone with his own demons. Reality around Kyle and Oblivion begins to shift back and forth as the two of them fling the life equation around. Back and forth, over and over they fight at a complete standstill. Kyle is powerful, but Oblivion is his own reflection and has the exact same power. Oblivion explains, Kyle knows the truth. He knows that he'll try to do the right thing, he won't alter life, but eventually he'll grow tired of those that oppose his hand. He'll dig deeper into his own self-righteousness, and eventually, he will remake everything until it is of his liking. Kyle grabs Oblivion. That will not happen! It will! You believe it or I wouldn't be here! He then throws Kyle down and he begins to absorb Kyle into himself. That's when Carol returns with what Kyle asked her to bring. Hope. Because she brought Kyle's friends. They all swoop in and they begin battling against Oblivion, throwing everything at him. All of them, the ones that stood by him when he needed it. With their weapons, they are able to cleave pieces of Oblivion off and hit him with the power of pure willpower. Kyle is drained and weakened by Oblivion's attack. He doesn't know what he can do any longer, but Oblivion tries to absorb the power that they throw at him, growing larger and larger. It's Saint Walker that tells the group, I don't think it's working. Kyle sees that they are feeding Oblivion, and then Oblivion explodes, pushing everyone back and reforming. Oblivion gets so strong that he can even alter reality for the Templar Guardians, and Kyle sees only one answer. He needs to end all of this. End the White Lantern rings which will end Oblivion. He will sacrifice himself for the good of the galaxy. Again. But, Saint Walker and Carol stop him. He isn't going to do it this time. He isn't going to sacrifice himself again. There needs to be another answer. And Carol gives him an idea. If the burden of the White Lantern is too much for him, change the game. Don't end the game. Kyle thinks about it and he comes up with the perfect answer. One person can't handle the life equation, so he asks for the Templar Guardian's help. He asks them to help him make more White Lantern rings, because this looks like a job for the White Lantern Corps. Unlike the rings that came out of Blackest Night, these rings will be permanent, and they will spread the life equation out there so it can't consume one person. But if it's ever needed, the rings can reform into one single ring again to stop a great evil. The rings fly off to six individuals telling them, you have the ability to preserve life in all of its forms. Will you join the White Lantern Corps? And each of them accept the ring. Oblivion, still growing stronger, asks Kyle what he did. And he tells him, something that I should have done a long time ago, given this power to others. The White Lanterns all converge on the planet and they begin bombarding Oblivion, finally shrinking down his power. And Kyle flies right through his center, pulling out the real Oblivion. He holds him up and he tells him, the ring was split seven ways, which means no one ring has the power to rule the galaxy. My fears are gone. And that means you are gone. And that's it. Oblivion fades into nothingness. And the new White Lanterns all head off to see what this new power can do. And the Guardians head off because they are always needed elsewhere. But Kyle is welcome to join them whenever he desires. Carol flies over to Kyle and asks him, Where's the seventh ring? You said that there were seven, but I only counted six. He goes to hand her the ring, but she stops him. Because she loves being a Star Sapphire. They look at each other, and then they take off into space. Because Kyle is ready to go home with Carol. The end.
And there you go, what we are calling the White Lantern Saga. Now, as I told you, we're going to be covering the Blackest Night and the Brightest Day in a much longer format, more akin to the style of content that we do now. But either way, I hope you enjoyed this, just getting a nice Cliff Notes version of what happened with Kyle Rayner as the White Lantern and how he officially ended it. Now, as you can tell at the end of the storyline, the White Lantern ring is kind of out there doing various things with various other individuals. They do briefly mention the White Lantern in the Rebirth story storyline, but as more of a way to just get rid of the White Lantern as opposed to, you know, actually using the White Lantern. So technically there's like one or two more mentions, but it gets disbanded and taken apart relatively quickly. So I really wouldn't consider that a part of the actual White Lantern saga. As far as I'm concerned, the Kyle Rayner storyline that ends with him making a White Lantern core is the saga. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to our channel, give this video a like, and let me know in the comments down below what you liked the most about the White Lantern Ring. And I'll see you next time right here 